welcome to the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education regular meeting for Wednesday, December 18th, 2019. Has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes, it has. Would you please call the roll? Carolyn? Here. Evans? Here. Turner? Herzog? Here. Olmstead? Here. Peschel? Here. Salaji? Here. We have quorum. Thank you very much. At this time, we will be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by four students from South Park Middle School. They are Ben Grill, Hannah Hayes, Nevea Nitka, and Chloe Henry along with uh, the music director from South Park Middle School, Patty Bourgeois. In addition uh, to their joining us tonight, the four students and the band leader from South Park Middle School are also going to lead us in singing, or actually we can sing, they're going to perform America the Beautiful. So I would invite you to stand and, and join in uh, the song. Thank you.
right. This is always such a special night because we get an opportunity to recognize another group of students, and this time for their work in the arts. Um, we have a long and proud history in this district of strong music education and strong art education, and it's always a pleasure to recognize student successes in those areas. So this evening we are recognizing students who have won art awards who represent the Northside Elementary Schools. Your artwork will be displayed on the uh, screen up there and some of you I know had an opportunity to walk around the central office and find your artwork hanging uh, in the halls and I hope that you got a chance to maybe get your picture taken with that as well as this one. So your names will be read. I will meet you over in front of the screen and we'll have a special certificate uh, for you in recognition of your outstanding work. And we know that this work just, does, just doesn't happen. Some of you probably have uh, talent that you were born with. I did not, especially, <laughs> especially in the art area. So I really appreciated the work of the many art teachers who worked with me to, tr to uh, develop my talents and also supportive parents. And I'm sure you all appreciate the parents and the art teachers you've worked with over the years as well. So with that, um, Dr. Cartwright will be reading your names and I will be handing out certificates. Are these they're in, order. in order? Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to the Oshkosh Area School District uh, Board of Education meeting. We're going to go ahead and get started tonight with our first group of students coming from Oshkosh North High School. So from Oshkosh North High School, our very first student is in the 12th grade, and her name, uh, the name is Theta Young. Our second student from Oshkosh North High School is an 11th grader, Willow Hun. Our next student is also from Oshkosh North High School, Tinley Diestler. Next up will be Sean Still. And then our last student from Oshkosh North High School is Parker Blau. We're going to go ahead now and transition over to Merrill Middle School. And we have two students, both of them being from sixth grade. Our very first student is Evan Aller. And our next student is Jasmine Vane. From here, we're going to transition over to Webster Stanley Middle School. Our first student there is Pele Tao. Our next student is Alexis Blau. And in eighth grade, Kylan Smith. Our next student I know for sure is absolutely here, <laughs> Jedediah Larson Peschel. Our next student as an eighth grader for Webster Stanley Middle is Aiden Corrigan. And last but not least from Webster Stanley Middle School is grade six, Olivia Dennis. Our next two students are fourth grade students from Emmeline Cook Elementary School. Please welcome Grace Ruby. And next is Alexa Lohr. We now get to go to Merrill Elementary School, a fifth grader, Pin Thayu Young. And over to Washington Elementary School, fourth grader, Camilla Marrero. And then we have a kindergarten student from Reed Elementary School, Bentley Christensen. <laughs> I think we might need to ask Bentley to come back up because I saw the looks on the back of the row. I don't think they captured the picture. Bentley, why don't you come back up here, little guy? 
I just saw the looks the, the look on the faces there. <laughs> Now we're transitioning over to Oaklawn Elementary School, second grader, Tristan Duckett. And then our last school is Webster Stanley Elementary School. We do have two second graders that will be celebrating there, David Kopecki. And last, oh, <laughs> last but not least, Kendall Traboda. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause for all the students who are here and those missing. All the parents and the grandparents and friends who are here to join them tonight uh, to share in this special night as well as their art teachers uh, who contributed to their success over the years. So again, give yourselves a round of applause and thank you. You're all welcome to stay for the meeting, um, but again, if you have other things to do tonight, um, we certainly understand. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we will move on then <laughs> to the board president's report. Um, this is a very busy time of year, as we all know, <laughs> and uh, with the lateness of the Thanksgiving holiday and the beginning of the winter holiday for the district, it's been a, a short time frame. Um, Mrs. Olmsted and I had an opportunity to visit North and West High Schools as well as the five middle schools on, I believe that was December 6th. Um, there have been so many musical events going on this month, um, it's difficult to attend all of them, but I would like to send my congratulations to the Lakeside uh, Elementary School for their excellent recent concert. Also Webster Stanley uh, Middle School held their annual musical recently, which was the musical Footloose, and I truly commend those who did the uh, chore choreography for that. I wish I were that um, coordinated as those young people were. They were, they were truly awesome. Uh, recently there was the West High Combined uh, Music Concert, Band, Orchestra, and Chorus. Those, those students did a remarkable job. There was the North High Choral Concert this week. Last night there was the West High, excuse me, the uh, North High Band Concert. I've also represented the district at the TIF district meeting, which was held yesterday morning. That involved reviewing a proposal to uh, purchase the, what many of us would know as the old St. Mary's School on Merritt Avenue. And uh, there's a proposal to purchase that and turn that into apartments and to build some garages. I also attended the CESA 6 Board of Control meeting. Uh, it was a shorter meeting this month, but we did have an update on their financial standing which has been quite good because it's considered it the word cooperative is where the C comes from in CESA and they're hoping to be able to return some of the profits from the organization to the member school districts in the coming year that would be able to be used for new services that the districts would like to purchase from CESA. And finally Dr. Cartwright and I attended the Hmong New Year celebration on Saturday hosted by the Hmong Service Center and it was great to be part of that uh, celebration that not only drew people from the greater Oshkosh area but from neighboring states so I commend all the the people for the various events and I apologize that I wasn't able to attend more but um, we have a remarkable district as I said with a long and proud history of success in the arts 
um, which include both the visual arts and the performing arts. So it's it's been a great uh, it's been a great time. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Cartwright for her uh, good news reports and the reports from our student representatives, as well as Dr. Cartwright's calendar. We're going to go ahead and start with the student representatives, if that's okay with the board at this point. Sure. Um, we're very appreciative of their flexibility, so thank you very much, both ladies, for being here this evening. And we'll start right away with Amelia from Oshkosh West High School. Good evening. My name is Amelia, as you all know. Um, and we have had, um, although December has been short, we have had a lot of things going on at West. So first with our athletics, um, girls basketball has had um, five games already and they've won three of them. So that is very nice and we are excited for them to continue winning and bringing home um, some trophies. Boys basketball, on the other hand, had started a little later than girls basketball and they had their first game on December 1st and they continue to um, become stronger and stronger um, throughout this month and we're looking forward to see some more wins. Um, varsity hockey have unfortunately lost both of the games that they've played. However, um, they have a full season ahead of them and um, we also look forward to them um, getting up there and winning. Um, girls dance team has had, they had their first competition on the 7th of December and I believe they got fourth, which is better than last year, so they improved on their, um, what they did last year, and um, they're very excited to see if they, when they can make it to state again this year. Uh, they also had a competition this past weekend in Little Shoot, and they did very well. Wrestling had their first competition on December 4th, and um, we have a very big team this year, and last year we sent many, many wrestlers to state, and they look forward to sending a lot of boys to state again this year. And then girls golf, uh, we had four or five girls, Hannah Eaton, Jensen Musa, Sage Wiesenberg, Kennedy Benish, and Elise Benish, um, who were selected as the academic all-state honorees by the Golf Coaches Association of Wisconsin. And uh, their season uh, wrapped up in uh, the beginning of fall. However, uh, their grades have shown and their athletic abilities have shown that they are set apart from others. <coughs> so music, um, just as our board president had just said, we have a lot of music um, and performing arts, things that have happened for West. Uh, the Sounds of the season con Seasons concert, um, which is was the whole music department, uh, the top bands and all the choirs and orchestra, um, was on Sunday, this past Sunday, December 15th, and it was a very big su success uh, since it was, however, it was on a uh, day where there was a Packer game, <laughs> but uh, the concert wrapped up very quick and all of our parents were very happy because they could go watch a pack game after they had watched a very nice concert. Um, the choir room decorating was on December 2nd, so we've had many um, lights and wrapping paper, Christmas tree ornaments, anything you could think of just scattered around the room, and um, it's very nice to see the holiday spirit. Eighth grade step up day, was on November 26th, and um, that was also um, a very big time for choir since uh, people, since the upperclassmen are leaving and we need a lot more students to come in next year. And so students from Traeger, South Park, and Tipler came to learn about the high school music program um, offered at West, and they sang songs together, did many musicals, and played many games, and there was also food. So I think many students plan on coming to the West Choirs next year. Uh, band eighth grade day step up day was, uh, was the Friday of d December 6th, I believe, and uh, Wind Ensemble traveled to different middle schools uh, to promote the band program. So I believe that went very well as well. 
Uh, magical season <coughs> is had been in full swing the whole December, and their last performance is this coming Friday. And many people are very sad because there are most of the group is made up of seniors, and so mm. there's going to be many uh, new magicals coming in next year. The marching band performed at in the Oshkosh Holiday Parade on November 14th, which was a while ago, but they were spreading Christmas spirit since then, or holiday spirit since then. And um, they were, the, the performance in Appleton on November 25th was canceled, sadly, but um, Oshkosh West is spreading um, holiday spirit from not only in Oshkosh, but many places in, around our area, which is exciting to hear. This, uh, this slide is something that happened quite a while ago, but we just got the results in, um, the, in the beginning of December, which is the one act play um, went to state and they got all state honors and uh, they also had an assembly that so many West students went to where they did a little snippet of their one act play and it was very heart-wrenching and very amazing to see like our our act our actors and performing arts students uh, get up there and uh, perform in front of other students, which is very hard to do. And then we had four outstanding lead actor awards. For holiday festivities around our school, the culinary arts students had baked 150 pies to donate to Father Cars for Thanksgiving meal um, on the Tuesday before break. So that happened a while ago, but we're still thinking about that. And then the animal science students made wreaths for the holiday parade on November 15th. And they were very impressed at how big the wreaths were. So that's, as you can see, the girls are. Student government has also been doing many activities to promote the holiday spirit and uh, help the school. So on December 9th, we, the student government went to Target and we bought presents for a family in need, for an adoptive family, and we wrapped them up very nicely and sent them off to try to make a difference in our community. Along with that, uh, on Mo Monday, December 16th, we went to a leadership conference and a Bucks game, and we were sad to see that the Bucks lost, but um, we learned a lot about leadership and what we can do to impact our community. Along with that, just this morning, there was we put on a staff breakfast for the holiday season, and Magicals came to perform. So another thing that's happening that was just released um, in our school is the West Report. You guys already know about the West Report since we have been over that, but just to emphasize it increased as compared to our last state report card, so we were very happy about that. I hope you have a great rest of your month and a uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's. Great holiday season. Thank you so much, Thank Amelia. You. And now we're going to trans over to Oshkosh North High School with Cabal. All right. So there's a lot that have been going on, but December has been very short, as Amelia has mentioned. So we'll go right into it. And if most of you guys remember from last month, in the morning of Veterans Day, we had the Sweat for a Vet event. And it was very successful for the very first year. We celebrated with a cake in our auditorium. And we raised over 500, not 500, <laughs> $5,000. <laughs> um, and we uh, gave that check to Lynn, their representative from Got Your Six Canines. Awesome. And just so you all know, if you don't already, the money will be going towards training service dogs for those who served our country. So that is a very good cause that we donated to. And as you guys already know, this week is right before Christmas break. So it is holiday week for us at North. And just last week, the Student Council Club um, held like, a, a toy drive for the Oshkosh Fire Department Food and Toy Drive. Um, and we collected a couple presents and toys for the kids that are in need, so that was really good. Um, 
We also have door decorating this year. And as you can see, some of our homerooms are very, very creative. And we have winners from each grade, including one homeroom that had multiple students from different grades in it. Um, and this year for basketball, our boys have been doing pretty good. Um, but they are very pumped up for the next couple of games. Um, the girls aren't doing too hot, but they're very pumped up for their games this week as well. And the boys game uh, for the swim team are doing really well. They finished fourth out of eight teams at the Oshkosh West invite on Saturday, um, the 7th. And last night they hosted the Appleton West versus Kimberly. And then our dance team also went to the um, competition in Ashwaubenon High School two Saturdays ago for their second competition of the season. And they will also be performing at our halftime to the basketball games, so don't miss out on the performances and come and watch. And the North Wrestling team has been doing pretty good, too. They have gotten two victories so far, and they will compete at Appleton North <coughs> tonight, uh, tomorrow night. And the Oshkosh Ice Hawks picked up their first victory of the season last Saturday, and they consist of students from Northwest, Lourdes, and Winnicani this year, and they are self-funded, so please come and support them at the 20th Avenue YMCA to support them. And for girls hockey, they play their games at the Blue Line Ice Center in Fond du Lac, and we have two Oshkosh girls on the team this year, and they're always looking for more girls, so um, support them as well. <laughs> And just today, our Communities One students, which are our sophomores and our freshmen, had their Right for Rights campaign today in our auditorium. And they are partnering with Amnesty International to make a difference internationally. Um, so they basically presented about a case that they studied, and they are trying to get signed letters to fight for justice for those who have been wronged. Um, and uh, the picture at the bottom right over there have been some students from the past that have actually made a change um, with their signed letters. So that just shows how much of an impact we can make as students. And our goal this year is 4,000 signed letters, but our attendance was kind of low this year, but um, we are hoping to still get a good amount of signed letters. And tomorrow night, our Magicals are gonna be having a concert at the Oshkosh Masonic Center from 7 to 8.30 p.m. So please come and celebrate with them for the holidays. And then um, on Friday, Ashgash North will be holding their annual um, holiday concert in our auditorium. So we are all looking forward to that. And coming soon, we have finals the week of January 13th. So we are all pumped about that. <laughs> 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 and then soon after finals, the week right after, we have winter formal on the Saturday, the 25th. So then we'll be having our Sasquatch days with our dress up days and everything. And then the Oshkosh North Musical will be starting their rehearsals and their performance <coughs> will be in February with more details to come. So have a safe and wonderful holiday, everyone. See you guys next month. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you so much, Cabal. And at this time, we're going to transition over into the superintendent's good news report. <coughs> and we're going to start right away with Lakeside Elementary School. Lakeside Elementary School recently received a visit from its PAL, which stands for Partner at Learning. This year's Lakeside PAL is the Oshkosh West High School Level 3 Global Academy. Lakeside looks forward to meeting with its PAL partner throughout the year to learn and grow together, as well as build positive relationships. The Encompass Classroom at Oshkosh West High School recently welcomed Paul Pollock from the J.J. Keller. Students and staff had a wonderful time learning about augmented reality and virtual reality. Congratulations to the Oshkosh West One Act Play, Our Place. Cast and crew members recently had an outstanding performance at the State Theater Festival, bringing home all state honors as well as Outstanding Ensemble Award and four Outstanding Actor Awards. Great job, everyone. Many of our school communities have organized food drives to help those in need this holiday season. The Emmeline Cook Elementary School community was able to donate a total of over 1,000 food items during its recent food drive. And the fourth and fifth graders at the Alps Charter School recently held a food drive with the Mid-Morning Kiwanis Club. 
All food items were donated to the Oshkosh Salvation Army. Thank you to all who donated. Fourth grade students at Washington Elementary School had the opportunity to have a virtual author visit with Amy Reed, author of You Are My Friend, a narrative nonfiction book about Mr. Rogers. After reading the book, students emailed Ms. Reed with a question. She responded and emails turned into an awesome author visit. Peace Lutheran Church in Oshkosh recently received an estate gift and felt called to share part of the gift with the community. The church chose to donate to Jefferson Elementary School. Members of the church's leadership team presented Principal Buchanan with a check for $2,500. Funds are designated to purchase items for students in need, including coats, snow pants, boots, hats and mittens, socks, pajamas, and so much more. We can't forget about Oshkosh North High School. Freshmen and sophomores in the Communities Program at Oshkosh North have embarked on a partnership with Amnesty International. Students are advocating for people who have been wrongfully treated by their government. Throughout this project, students have been studying cases from all areas of the world and diving into human rights issues. <clears throat> The South Park Middle School Giving Tree is alive and well once again this year. The staff and families of South Park have contributed much needed items for 20 students in need this year. Additionally, South Park recently held a Culver's Night to raise money for the Panther Way, the school's PBIS initiative. Families and staff came out to support the cause, and as a result, South Park was able to raise close to $300. The Magicals from Oshkosh North and Oshkosh West have been, been, have been very busy spreading cheer this holiday season. Both groups perform regularly in the community during the month of December, and many of us in the district have had the pleasure of enjoying their per performances. As superintendent, I remain committed to being <coughs> present and engaged in our schools and throughout Oshkosh. On the screen, you're gonna see a few examples where I've been spending my time, uh, but it's a little bit different than, a little, than what you typically may have seen me uh, previously. However, given the incident that recently occurred within the school system, my calendar was adjusted um, accordingly to that. Uh, one of the points I would like to highlight for you today, and I don't wanna steal Mr. Evans' thunder by any stretch of the imagination, um, but was an opportunity uh, today where I was able to go to Madison um, and meet with our state superintendent, our deputy superintendent, as well as many legislators. Um, this opportunity was provided through CESA 6, and many superintendents within the CESA 6 um, was able to participate with us. It was an opportunity to give our gratitude to our legislators for the support that they have been providing to the school systems across the entire state. Um, while we were there, um, also just to let you know, uh, continue to lobby uh, for some additional support uh, for our school systems, for specifically uh, looking at our Fund 80 and how that is used, utilized in order to potentially look at how can we leverage those that particular fund in order to fund school resource officers and specifically full-time school resource officers within our secondary schools. We value our partnerships with, um, with uh, the Oshkosh uh, Police Department. One thing note is, um, of important note is that we've had this partnership for multiple years and as a result of that have had relationships with them, ongoing conversations, training that's very specific. Therefore, our SROs are fully equipped and, and ready to engage with our students. Um, second thing that we also took a look at was related to behavioral and mental health funding um, and services for our school systems. Uh, we know that um, in this past uh, budget session for the governor, that was one of the areas uh, for what Governor Evers had requested. We did not get the full fund. Uh, he did, was not able to get the full funding for which um, was put into there. So we just had some conversations related to that. Want to make sure that we keep that on the forefront and have opportunities as they may present themselves to revisit those conversations so we can ensure that we are providing to the needs of our students across the entire district. So I just wanted to at least emphasize some of the conversations um, so that you are aware exactly what those conversations were. 
And at this point in time, uh, that will conclude my report, and I will. Uh, we do not have any district administrator supplemental reports for you tonight, so I'll turn this back over to you, Dr. Harrisoff. Thank you very much, Dr. Cartwright. Lots, lots going on in the district and out of the district. I believe there may be some committee reports to this evening. Yes. This is the logic. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. There's your two. All right, so we had a meeting um, Thursday, December 5th. We had two items on the agenda. The first one was the social studies review, and that was led by Vicki Poirier. Um, she gave us an update on how building the curriculum has gone for um, a committee that was formed last year. So this past summer, the K-5 through task force <coughs> met, and they unpacked the Wisconsin social studies state standards. It's been 22 years since the last resources were adopted for social studies, and that's true of other schools in the state as well. Um, and in fact, other schools are watching what this committee in Oshkosh is doing to see what sort of curriculum plans we come up with. They did pilot units for grades kindergarten, first, fourth, and fifth. And the team reorganized in the fall and worked with the suggested scope and sequence that came from the state, and they created a more teacher-friendly document. Um, let's see. They, they've checked textbook vendors, but they're not very happy with the results. So what they're finding is that those textbooks don't really meet teachers' or students' needs. Um, so instead, they've created a lot of partnerships, which is really cool. They are using resources from University of Wisconsin-Madison's <coughs> Children's Cooperative Book Center, and that is a leader in equity when it comes to materials. They also um, are partnering with the Oshkosh Herald to help support student inquiry standards, and they have a grant through the DPI that um, helps the teachers work with the Wisconsin Historical Society, and they also have a partnership with the Oshkosh Public Museum and the Paint Art Center. So it's cool to see how they're working with all these different groups to build a good curriculum for our students. Um, we talked about how social studies is an untapped way to support literacy and how you know when students are learning about things that interest them, that builds their reading comprehension. Um, the goal is to expand the pilot in the 2020-21 school year with full implementation in the 21-22 school year. There was mention of a need for an FTE to work with teachers in creating the unit frameworks and to put together kind of grab and go kits. Back um, last year, I think it was in the spring, so this year, in the spring of this year, last school year, when this was presented to the board, there was a note of that FTE being needed. This was just a slight adjustment. It, it's now for K through five, um, which is what they've been focusing on. So that was it from our social studies update. The second part of our meeting was led by um, Ms. Conrad. It was a review of the school and district report cards from the school board meeting on December 4th. We just got to dive a little bit deeper into those results. Um, we talked about the supports that are in place for any schools that had a reduced score. We talked about um, the growth that we've made as a district and making sure that people understand um, how that growth looks and how to read that on the overall scores. And we talked about that, I know this is a couple weeks ago, but that slide that uh, had the line and we were on the right side of the line with progress being made um, in the area of our shifting demographics with more in free and reduced students, but the district is making strides with those students. Um, and that covers everything from our meeting. Our next meeting is, when is it? Thursday, January 2nd at 8.30 a.m. And that's the Education Committee, correct? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, did I not no, say I that? <laughs> you did, I missed it. I'm sorry. May I clear my card? Absolutely. Yeah. If you don't mind, Ms. Lodgy, so the chart you're referring to is a scatter, a scatter plot? Yeah. And you're absolutely right, being on the right side of where that line is exactly where you want to be. And as the Oshkosh Area School District continues to increase in the percent of students that are receiving free and reduced lunch, you're correct, we want to make sure that we stay yeah. on that right-hand side because over the past 10 years where we have almost doubled the, the, the percent of students mm -hmm. on free and reduced lunch, that's something we pay close attention to. Yeah, that was kind of the slide, because we, like I said, we were just digging a little deeper and that was the one we really focused on, how good that is that we have stayed on that side. Thank you. Uh-huh. Very good, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Evans, do you have reports I do. this evening? <clears throat> the Legislative Committee met on Thursday, December 12th. Um, 
And the first thing we covered was the, um, the, the, the items that are going to be voted on at the Delegate Assembly in Milwaukee and at the WASB uh, State Convention, which is also in our board packet today for approval. So I'm not going to go through and read every one of those. Um, we discussed a little more on a potential resolution coming before the board here on legislation to protect schools. Um, just kind of finessing that a little bit of how we wanted to stay, say. <coughs> um, I gave a brief legislative update, but because they're on, on break, there wasn't a whole lot going on. And then we had a, a pretty uh, lengthy discussion on, on school safety. Um, and uh, Representative Gordon Hens is going to be at our January meeting, so if people that are not on the committee want to come and have a conversation with Gordon. Um, that meeting is going to be on January 28th at 8.30 in the morning. Thank you, Mr. Evans. A new record for a short report. <laughs> <laughs> Was that 8.30, Jim, on the 28th? 8.30 okay. on the 28th. Dr. Cartwright? I just quick clarification uh, when I was giving my report about meeting with legislators I just want to make it clear that it's our lo our local legislators that we were having the conversations with not all legislators just a point of clarification thank you I think that what you attended today was an annual event uh, coordinated by CESA 6 to thank local lawmakers uh, for their support of public education over the last year. Absolutely, and again, we're extremely grateful. Um, we had definitely a very not healthy increase in our budget um, across the entire state, which is finally attuned right now to behavioral and mental health um, services and those needs, and ensuring that we're providing the proper supports. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank Are you. there any other reports this evening? All right, then we'll, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is non-agenda related public forum. There was no one who signed up for that. The following agenda item then is agenda related public forum. Again, no one signed up to speak this evening. So we will move on to our consent resolution agenda. For the consent agenda, the board has been furnished with background materials on each item or has discussed it at a previous meeting. These will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. If a board member wants to discuss any item, it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and will be voted on separately. Is there any item that anyone wishes to take off at this point? Okay, I'm going to ask that we take uh, 7B off of the consent agenda. And so I would entertain a motion to approve the remaining items. So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Do you need to call them out what the items are? Do I? I guess I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, move this meeting along. The board will consider approval of one, minutes of the November 20th, 2019 special board meeting, two, minutes of November 20th, 2019 regular board meeting, three, minutes of November 20th, 2019 executive session of regular board meeting, four, minutes of December 4th, 2019 regular board meeting, Number five, minutes of December 4th, 2019, executive session of regular board meeting. Number six, bills payable. Number seven, personnel, A, appointments, resignation, and salaries. B, excuse me, eight, NEOLA policy updates. A, 0142.4 oath. B, 0165.1, notice of regular meetings. C, 3111, creating a position. D, 411, creating a position. E, 4132 vacancies. F, 5830 student fundraising. G, 6152 student fees, fines, and charges. H, 6470 payment of invoices. I, 6510 payroll authorization. J, 6610 student activity fund. K, 6630 cash handling and deposits. This is a new policy. L, 6830 audit. M7300 disposition of real property. N7310 disposition of real property. O7455 accounting or fixed assets. P8660 transportation by private vehicle. And Q9600 staff/student participation in community events. 
I believe we had a motion and a second already on this. All right, please call the roll. Carlin? Aye. Evans? Aye. Garner? Herzog? Aye. Olmstead? Aye. Peschel? Zalaji? Aye. Motion carried. All right, thank you very much. Then we will go back to Resolution 7B. Be it resolved that the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education approve the retirements as filed with the Secretary to the Board of Education. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, once again, I had asked that this one be pulled. We have three individuals who are choosing to enter a new stage of life called retirement. Uh, they include Michelle Dollinger, who is an, currently an ESL teacher at South Park Middle and Carl Traeger Middle, and she's been in the district for roughly four years. Uh, Robert McMahon, full-time in the district as a media specialist, dividing his time between North High School and Central Administration, and he has been employed in the district since 1990, uh, with his retirement coming in July, so he will have uh, served the students and staff of this district for 30 years. And finally, Deborah Vandekoek, a half-time account clerk one in the central office, who has been with the district since uh, 2015. We want to wish all of these people a long, healthy, and happy retirement and thank them for their many contributions to the success of the students of our district and for assisting us in serving our families and our community. Any other comments or questions on these three retirements? Okay, uh, do we have a motion on this one? We do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, then please call the roll. Evans? Aye. Garner? Urzog? Aye. Olmstead? Aye. Peschel? Aye. Salaji? Aye. Carlin? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Then the next agenda item is individually considered resolutions, and we have two this evening. Uh, this is resolution nine. Be it resolved that the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education hereby direct the WASB delegate to support resolutions forwarded to all WASB members prior to the convening of the assembly. Be it further resolved that the WASB delegate is directed to vote on amendments or resolutions that arise from the floor of the delegate assembly in a manner that is consistent with the position of the original resolutions as filed with the Secretary to the Board of Education on December 18, 2019 in accordance with the rules, regulations, and policies of the Board of Education. We need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. second. Is there any discussion? Please call the roll. Garner? Rizzo? Aye. Homestead? Aye. Special? Aye. Zalaji? Aye. Carver? Aye. Evans? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. And finally, uh, individually considered resolution number 10, approval of the Rise Up program funding. Be it resolved that the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education approve the additional funding for Rise Up as filed with the Secretary to the Board of Education. So moved. Second. Second. I think we might need a stopwatch to <laughs> determine who uh, gets credit. We'll leave that up to uh, our Secretary this evening. Uh, I believe Mr. Kemmer has joined us to uh, give us some additional information on this resolution. Yeah, so for those of you not familiar with Rise Up, Rise Up is our school-based mental health framework that we have for the entire district. So it really consists of three components. The first is an educational piece. So we want to provide education on mental health for our students, but also our staff, parents, and the community. There's also an identification piece that includes the wellness screen that is currently in place for students in grades 8 through 12. Uh, takes place once each year. Um, and all students uh, can participate in going through the screening process, uh, which can identify um, any social emotional difficulties. And then the last piece is direct services. And as a part of our direct service uh, component, we partner with Catalpa Health. And uh, Catalpa comes into nine of our 20 schools provide clinical therapy services for students in need. Um, we're expanding to three additional schools in January and that's a part of our DPI school-based mental health grant. Uh, one of the things that we're finding this year is that uh, the clinical therapy in our schools is being utilized more than it has been in the past. 
which is a good thing, but it's also created a situation where we currently have a wait list in each of our schools that currently has the clinical therapy available. So the wait list in some of our schools is, is much longer than others. Um, and anytime a student um, is identified as being in need of the clinical therapy, parents are given the option of being able to take their child to be seen in the actual Catalpa clinic, either in Oshkosh or Appleton, rather than going on the wait list. But a lot of parents prefer that their child go on the wait list to be seen by a Rise Up clinician in the school. So um, what we would like to do is uh, purchase additional time for more clinical therapy uh, to take place in the schools where there are significant wait lists to really bring that down and make it more manageable. Uh, and, and that's going to create a situation where we have more students <coughs> that are being seen. Um, unfortunately, with the wait list in some of our schools, if, if we don't add that additional time, it, it could be a situation where they might not even be able to be seen this year. That's how quickly the wait lists are, are beginning to um, increase. Mr. Kimmy, can you highlight just uh, quickly that this is not necessarily, um, we're very fortunate in that we're able to apply for grant funding on this as well. Can you talk us through that just a tad? Yeah, yeah. So we're always looking for additional funding to support a Rise Up program. So um, we currently are working uh, or proposed additional funding through the United Way. Uh, we're hoping to get some funding through them to, to support this piece of, of the Rise Up program. Um, and then any additional grant funding that is being made available through the state will also continue to apply for to expand uh, this component of Rise Up. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim. And board, I wanted to at least bring this to you tonight. Uh, we wanted to, only because we were pushing up against the, the, the dollar threshold. Um, so we wanted to ensure that you were aware of that, but also let you know that we are actively working on ensuring Hopefully we can uh, secure grant funding rather than district funding, but in the event we are not able to secure grant funding, we would be, uh, we would be pulling this from our general funds um, for which we have already reviewed and we would be able to um, cover. Uh, I just remind all of us, though, the more we do this, the more it takes away from some of our other programming. However, we are in a position where if grant funding does not occur, we will we'll pursue it through district funds. Uh, because it's just not acceptable um, from our leadership perspective to have students on a wait list that will not be seen this year. Thank you, Dr. Cartwright. Obviously, we have a lot of needs in the district, and it's important that we address those uh, in a timely manner. Mr. Pesch. Mr. Yep, thank you. Um, in the report, uh, letter F, there's a, a statement. The first line talks about the cost of one day of clinical therapy for the district cost between eight to eleven thousand dollars. Correct. So that's that's a, in our current state. Yes. So, um, and so that number ranges. Why does that number range from eight to ten? It's a good question. Um, the the reimbursement rate for services depends on the student's insurance. Uh, students who um, are insured through like Medicaid, the reimbursement rate is much lower than through private insurance. So in some of our schools that have more students on Medicaid, uh, they tend to be reimbursed at a lower rate so the program ends up costing more versus schools that have more students who are privately insured. Follow up? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, and so and that, that number, so some schools, what you're saying is that some schools that depending on the kids cost more than others yes to, in order in order to maintain that mm -hmm. so um, and the benefit of of adding those three schools that we're talking about in January what what is the benefit of adding that other than having services how does that number look related to this to that is, does this let me put that a different way does that number incorporate the three additional schools that we're going to have in January so those three additional schools are being funded through the DPI school-based mental health okay. grant. So we received $75,000 per year for two years through that grant, which covers those three schools. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Mrs. Olmstead? I think it's really important. I'm glad that Mr. Peschel brought that up, that it, parents understand that we, we're doing grants on this, but also we get reimbursed by parents' insurances. So mm -hmm. they can choose to go outside, and it's not they're choosing to go outside or they're choosing to go to the school day. It's not whether or not they're paying. They're paying both through their insurance. 
Um, I just wanted to make that clear to the public that we are getting reimbursed by, by um, families insurances when they have that available and we need money to pay for it and we do grants. So it's, it's all of it we're trying to capture. Yeah, so the best way to explain it is Catalpa is essentially operating clinics out of our schools. Right. right. So they would bill insurance just like if, if you went and saw somebody at their clinic. And I just think it's really important that the public knows that. Okay. Can, I'm sorry, okay. may I have one more? Mm -hmm. Yes. So just in regards to, to numbers of kids that are utilizing these, um, I know that there's wait lists, but wait lists sometimes just suggest that there's a higher quantity of kids that are looking for some, looking for that service or families are. Um, the numbers of kids and families that are going out to those sites, I think you said there's one in Oshkosh and one in Appleton. Appleton. Mm -hmm. um, do we do we have uh, we, do we have a, a good number of families that are reaching out for these services off-site? Correct. Yeah, I don't know the exact number of, of students that are being seen at the actual clinics, um, and I don't know how many of those students that were being seen at the clinic are now seeking support in the school. Okay. Um, it's really difficult to get that information from Catalpa. So now, um, just just in general. Uh, sometimes seeking support comes with stigmas, mm -hmm. right? I mean, not even not just for families, but a lot of times for kids as well. And depending on where they are in their schooling, or what level of schooling, and there's there's there could be more stigmas related to that. And so, so just so that the public knows, we've we've done we've we've put these clinics in our schools, where it can reduce those stigmas sometimes of of where kids see other kids going to these places and and they think things and or maybe they don't but mm -hmm. just in the case that we're, we're protecting them in that sense and, and and we are doing that correct yeah absolutely and that's where the education piece comes in mm -hmm. as a part of the education we're hoping to destigmatize mental health uh, the more we talk about it the more acceptable it's going to be to seek support um, so we're uh, creating an atmosphere where we can have those conversations and, and talk about mental health in a number of different ways and it's not just the room that they go and seek help in. It's 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 the whole school that that is part of that conversation and that de destigmatization. Mm -hmm. Correct. Absolutely. So, okay. If I may, that's also one of the things that um, I I brought forward to our state superintendent and deputy um, super deputy state superintendent today was in education. Oftentimes, we state mental health. And we, and we understand that mental health is a very encompassing term, um, and it also has a, a huge range of needs that go with it. And so my recommendation was, rather than just saying mental health, for, because the general public sometimes gets this confused, to call it behavioral and mental health, mm -hmm. uh, because so many times individuals who have pure mental health um, concerns most often are not the individuals who are creating these acts of violence. Um, but you do see that a little bit more. And behavioral belongs within mental health. It's just parsed out a little bit more. Um, and unfortunately, that is where you do see, see some of those um, acts of violence sometimes that are occurring. So the conversation was very particular um, in order to try to destigmatize it because we don't want the work that um, we have been doing so hard over a period of years now to be degraded at this point. Any other comments or questions on this item? Mm -hmm. All right, I believe we have a motion and a second on this one, so please call the roll. Urza? Yeah, aye. Olmstead? Aye. Heschel? Aye. Zalaji? Aye. Carlin? Aye. Evans? Aye. Garner? Motion carried. Very good. And thank you, Mr. Kemmer. All right, with that, we will move on to our uh, one workshop item for this evening, which is on the Facilities Advisory Committee recommendations. I believe Dr. Gunlock, Mr. Fox, and others may. Sure. Cast of favorites. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Hazak, I'm going to set this up if that's okay as we as yes. we are coming to the table. Um, this is a series of conversations that we are going to be engaging with the community on as well as with the board. And so we want to uh, let people know ahead of time that we're going to be continuing to use this slide deck um, that you're seeing up on board. However, each presentation is going to have a different point of interest. 
um, so that you can have the opportunity to have greater conversation and in-depth conversation and ask us a lot of questions or whatever questions may be on your mind so that you can feel comfortable and confident with the level of knowledge as you proceed with any type of recommendations that you would like to give to us. Um, so for tonight, you know, what you will notice is that a majority of our presentation is going to be more on slide number two that's coming up here very soon. Um, <coughs> however, we'll do a brief overview for the remainder of the slides, but again, just a, a, a fundamental reminder, tonight's conversation really is directed towards um, slide number two, unless you direct us differently. Okay. Um, Thank you. So Sorry, as Dr. Up. Cartwright indicated, uh, what this slide deck essentially does is it goes over what was previously shared with the board. We thought it would be wise to share it once again because one of the things that we heard in the survey was there were still a lot of questions uh, in the community in terms of what what did each of these components mean and what you know there were a lot of questions about that. Um, one of the recommendations from the FAC was to pursue an April 2020 capital referendum and there were really two parts to that. If you'll remember in the survey, there were four parts to phase one. Um, these are the first two of those. Uh, the first uh, part would be safety and security updates to district facilities. Uh, those largely involved moving office areas, swapping them out to get them more towards the exterior of the building to create an appropriate entryway uh, around security. Uh, there have also been some potential updates to that where we would look at uh, uh, some messaging technology that would be added into this package as well, um, especially given uh, the recent events at Oshkosh West. Uh, that's something that is, is very much on the forefront of all of our minds. So uh, one of the other things on the safety and security side of this would also be uh, looking at potentially refreshing uh, the security cameras that we currently have inside the district. So all of that would be inside of the security component part of it. The immediate building infrastructure and maintenance needs, as we said at the last time we presented, the lion's share of that amount is approximately $9 million for uh, Oshkosh West and Oshkosh North. That involves uh, tr uh, electrical upgrades to the systems. There are also uh, some other uh, maintenance items that we looked at uh, recently that, that we would recommend adding on top of that as well and that goes along the lines of that that bottom paragraph where one of the things that uh, the FAC recommended was con considering looking at a few additional maintenance items especially around the area of life safety um, and there's several of those in there as well so um, it would be very similar to what we surveyed in terms of safety and security building infrastructure and maintenance uh, however, there would be some small additions to that in the final package that the board would uh, eventually consider, potentially. So that's, that's one of the recommendations that we have at this point. Now we're going to kind of boomerang through this, go through the other pieces, and then come back. Dr. Gunlock, if you wouldn't mind, when you were talking about communication packages related to school safety, can you dive just a tad bit deeper on that for us? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we realized is that we have inconsistent uh, systems throughout the district in terms of, of communications. Like what used to be uh, a PA system is used for a lot more than just a PA system now. Uh, it is now part of our emergency communications infrastructure. What we would ideally like to have is a system where uh, anybody inside the, the district could tap into it. We, we kind of have that now, but the technology is rel relatively limited that the message stops at the speaker. Uh, one of the things that we would want to do is enhance that so the message not only goes through the speaker, but it would be displayed on every screen in the district. So you can imagine an incident happening at a school um, and a, uh, uh, somebody who knows about the incident can trigger an emergency communication system. Uh, that message not only goes out to audio throughout the entire what you would normally deem a traditional PA system, but it also uh, would flash across all the screens in the district. And we have 700 plus classrooms. Uh, all of those are, are often in use at any given point in time. You could imagine them uh, showing perhaps a video or a YouTube video or something in class and they might miss the message. Well, they wouldn't miss the message if all of a sudden we take over all the screens and it shows up on all the screens. Okay. Um, <coughs> the other thing is we have a largely analog PA system now. 
um, this would look at moving to a digital IP based PA system that would give us greater flexibility in terms of where messages go, how they get there, and by whom. Um, some of that is limited right now. That would remove those limitations. I have a few questions. Um, so the PA, are, does each school have its own, I, does, is it the same PA system through every building? Are any of them digital? Are they all still no. analog? No, everyone is analog at okay. the moment. And are they pretty similar to each other? No, uh, okay. they're getting they're getting more similar. We, we've been working to make them more okay. unified. They remind me a lot of the way the phone system used to be. Okay. Uh, when we first started, there were six different phone systems in the district. Uh, that wasn't wasn't very effective. It was also very hard to train people on how to use them. If they went from one building to another, the system would operate differently. Okay. We now have a unified system throughout the different district that does more than just phones. Right. Um, for example, when you call 911 off of one of our phones, it sends messages to a wide variety of people alerting us that when that happens. Um, that's that's largely available through the fact that it's a digital IP based phone right, right. that allows us to do different things. Um, also allows uh, greater portability of devices and you know the, the, the information just follows the person. So the the PA systems do we how old are some of these systems and are they all functioning properly? I'll let you take that one. The I mean, when's the last time we looked at that? I know we do maintenance on them and we keep, you know, we try to update them, but are some of them really old? Like, where are they sitting? No. Uh, we were able to take advantage of uh, some grant opportunities through the uh, security grant, mm -hmm. uh, through our own uh, maintenance CIP funding. So we have gone through, we have done some refreshing at the head end. Um, so the systems at the head end are not antiquated, but they are antiquated in the sense that, as Dave had said, um, they're just analog language. So right. they work. Every school is safe. We're able to communicate with the classrooms in, in the broader sense of, of a, a large announcement. Right. Um, but there are limitations to that. Right. Um, you know, if we have any wiring issues, we are using the original infrastructure in, of the wiring in that building. Uh, we are, to a large extent, utilizing many of the original speakers within that building. And ultimately, um, we're relying on the fact that the person in the classroom is going to hear that particular message. And we don't know, the, the sender does not know if, if, if the person is actually receiving that message. And, and um, to that point, um, I think if, if we can send a message on, on a variety of different platforms, it's, it's to benefit the end right. user. The other advantage is, is prioritization of messages. In an analog system, whoever picks up the, the, you know, you can imagine somebody picking up a microphone, you can talk over each other very easily. Mm -hmm. In an IP-based system, we can make it a little bit more intelligent to where we can prioritize some of those communications. So if somebody was busy doing an announcements about make sure you get your milk counts in and there's an emergency, the, the person's going to be able to jump right over the top in an emergency. Okay. So there's just some additional flexibilities for things like that. So when you're looking at these systems with Obviously, with the current you know events that we've been having that we had here, um, obviously the systems are really important. Were you looking at we're putting this, adding additional or looking at more specifically things like this under the safety and security? Um, were we looking at that for particularly certain schools or across the district? What were you guys? What were you suggesting or what were you thinking? Uh, so, Ms. Olson, we're um, we're kind of on the bottom paragraph where it said that it, the, where the FAC said that the board may find it prudent to consider additional right. investments. Yeah. So, what we're looking at is beyond the enhancing the security efforts of those um, entrances, interior doors, and additional technology, and adding to that list at this point in time. Um, for example, this communications project, mm -hmm. uh, well, this communications component, mm -hmm. as well as the second um, additional safety concern uh, thing that we were looking at security cameras thank you yeah. and on those security cameras we're not talking about replacing every security camera we're only talking about the original security the older camera ones, the, right, yeah, right, that right. are getting to an age where they will start feeling right so going back to the, my question is that so we're putting it it is the additional funds it's your next level but it's under security and safety but is it for particular schools or the whole district well that's a really good question because one of the things that will and some of this is is 
part later in the presentation, but one of the discussion points has been um, if you look at the other part of phase one, the rebuilding of a Merrill, the rebuilding of a Webster, right. um, one of the recommendations of the FAC was don't put a lot of money into those mm -hmm. facilities. You know, we don't need to be doing that if we're going to be replacing <coughs> those facilities. That would right. not be wise. Yeah. However, we need to make sure we maintain a safe and secure environment until that right. time happens. Exactly. Um, if we were to if we were to be fortunate enough to go for these funds to do these projects and we were fortunate enough to get them we would probably prioritize and start putting them into uh, facilities that we know are going to be longer lasting first because we're not going to be able to do the whole district in one shot anyways so we'd probably take those facilities that we know are going to be here first in the first part of the implementation and in the the later parts of the implementation we would probably look at targeting some of those facilities that might end up going away with the hope that by that time we will have moved on to the second part of some of these recommendations and come back and decided what we're going to do with some of those older sites like a Merrill, like a Webster, like a South Park, like a Roosevelt, you know, mm -hmm. like a Washington. We, we, would have, we would come back and say, okay, what are we going to do with those facilities? I would not recommend making improvements like this at those sites first, at the expense of the other sites, because it might you might be be expending dollars that you're not going to get the value of. Right. But in consideration of which schools statistically would need safety first, regardless if those schools are gone, regardless of if a school how old it is or whether we're keeping it or not, right. I would say that we wouldn't we want to, to statistically when you look at schools that have um, that might be you know, secondary, elementary, yep. you know, statistically, which one has more, you know, problems where you're going to need that security, we would obviously do that. That would trump whether or not that school is going to, what we're doing with that school. Yes, and, and let, let me be super clear on this. Yeah. Our, our systems are working today. Our security cameras are working today. We, we, we would continue to maintain those systems in those sites. We just wouldn't be reinvesting in that type of technology going forward. Got it. Thank forward. you. Okay. Thank so. you. Now I get it. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Gullick. And, and it's going to take like two years for us to do this anyway, so right. that other tech is going to phase out as the new tech phases in. Right. Like so. other Great. Thank you. Okay. Other questions on this particular one? That was awesome. Because yes. we'll come back to this one, too. Yep. Yes. I have a question. Um, you said uh, 700 screens. 700 classrooms, 700 and we classrooms. have we have a, a device similar to this in each one of them. Oh, so that that was my question. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so and so that would indicate that these are all more up to date screens mm -hmm. uh, across the board, so that it makes it easier yep. for them to interact uh, through the through. What is it uh, through IP addresses yes. and stuff and such? Yeah, so we, we, we have a couple of different technologies that we can use. It's not really important which technology sure. we're using. It's just important to understand that it would take over that screen. Um, we've replaced 320 classrooms already with, with BenQ boards. That was a project that was done last summer. This upcoming summer, as part of our Learning Without Limits initiative, we're going to do the remaining classrooms at the secondary schools. We've been surveying our secondary teachers uh, over the past couple of weeks about what are the key features they need to use instructionally because this is a key instructional tool now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Our teachers have given us awesome feedback. We're taking that on January 8th to the District Technology Committee. They're going to pour over all that, and that's going to help us generate what the RFP is. But the ultimate result is a year from now, a little less than that actually, when we start next school year, 100% um, of our 700 or so classrooms will have an interactive whiteboard in it that we can take over and display a message as we need to. Um, awesome. This would be a key piece of that, feeding that, that particular function. That's good. Now I want to test your knowledge. Oh boy. So, <laughs> so they didn't tell me there was going to be a test. <laughs> so there's 700 classrooms that we have screens in and that we want to maintain screens in. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many um, uh, secondary rooms that we use for educational support do we have in the district? Oh. Uh, approximately 400 of those. It's, it's, it's about a 320 to probably 380 split okay. between, between 612 and K-5. And those are rooms that we don't feel that we need to have a screen like mm. this in? No, we do. We so, do. so there's 320 classrooms at the elementary okay. level. There's Thank 380, you. and uh, don't hold me to these I exact won't. numbers, but we're close. <laughs> there's 380 or so classrooms at the grade 6 through 12 level. 
Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, you, so oh, you mean like a speech and language? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's uh, very few of there's very few of these screens in those spaces, uh, largely because they're spaces that are very small. And a screen sure. like this would not necessarily be necessary. And there's a lot a of those classrooms are like one-on-one -on -one with the sure. teacher, too. Right, yeah. right. There's a couple. There, there, yeah. there, there are some in the district that we have it. Uh, but uh, for the most part, no. These are classrooms with a full classroom worth of kids in them. Awesome. Okay. You did give me good information. So <laughs> I, I, like, I like the so fact that you split it out between the, between the, the grade levels. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's a good number to, to, to understand and digest. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I apologize, I know I keep putting you on the spot. Well, number two, um, where we're talking about, so we know about some of the roof sections and some of the electrical systems at some of our existing schools. <coughs> what are some of those priority areas that we would potentially be considering in order to look at that we may need to add to number two? Okay, so if we take a look here, I'm gonna bring it up on the screen because I created this while you were. Mm -hmm. While you were here, let's just bring make this a little bigger. So these were these were some of the ones that we talked about in terms of life safety, and this is sort of basically the distilled list of what we looked at earlier today. So I'll, I'll hand that over to to Jim to take a look, and, <coughs> and we can go through each one of these. Right. Initially, we had um, um, we had indicated with a survey out to the community that we were looking at two large projects that involve electrical at both, both West and North High School. Um, now, after that survey was returned, we took another look and we, and we sat down and discussed, well, what other priority items are out there at that point? And, and we came up with a, a slightly larger list than what you see in front of you today. Um, no rhyme or reason, these are items that were deferred maintenance, they're, they're critical items for schools, either they were failed items or there are items that we couldn't yet afford. Um, but really in taking a second look at that this morning, we decided to distill that list down to something a little bit more understandable. So we identified areas that touch on life safety. Uh, we thought that was a, a critical need within a district. Let's, let's look at our deferred maintenance items, but specifically items that touch on, on life safety. So what you'll see on this particular list, uh, Carl Traeger, boilers, boiler room, uh, piping and pumps, uh, that is a boiler room, one of two boiler rooms that we were not able to touch as part of our Act 32 energy initiative. Uh, that is something that we certainly do want to take care of that we've had some, some past issues with. Um, electrical, of course, you'll see west, north. Uh, Kimball will show up twice on this list. Um, yeah, we can scroll down. One for electrical um, that we've begun an uh, electrical engineering study on and one for rigging. Both are, are life safety. The rigging, of course, is the everything hanging above the stage. Um, it, is, it is well past uh, its inspection period, and uh, we're rectifying that right now. So it was inspected. Uh, we understand what needs to be done, and in fact, we have an RFP out currently for the re-rigging process. The, if you could scroll up. The you other bet. items that we identified were uh, fire systems, uh, we have been actively engaging in updating our fire alarm systems. I believe we have five schools that are currently operating a modern fire alarm system. Um, so these were the next uh, five that we were targeting. We did have them identified from, about f three years ago we identified our schools from absolute uh, worst to the, to the most modern, if you will, to allow us a pathway to um, advance th these particular fire alarm systems in our building. So these are the next five critical buildings that are on our list for fire alarm systems. Um, and are they're there the generators? Because, yep, and they're okay. there because we felt um, that they're the greatest need. And then these are generators that we currently have in schools now that have failed uh, with the exception of, um, I th thought North was on that list, it may have, it may have fallen off. Uh, North and these four particular sites are the only ones that operate generators currently. These generators have failed, I believe, I believe one of those is operating, but it is on its last legs at this point. Uh, the reason these are important is because when we do lose electricity, the, those particular schools require the generator to operate safety lights for proper egress within those facilities. Uh, so we definitely want to get those back up and running in a, and we can only do that through a replacement. Ideally, we w ideally it would be nice to have generators in all sites because there's more and more 
uh, equipment that is operated obviously by electricity. That includes your security cameras, that includes your door access systems. We can go all the way up and down the line. Now we do have some battery backup, but the battery backup systems routinely last 30 to 45 minutes. Might be able to stretch it to an hour, but I would only count on about 30 minutes. And then things start to drop off. Um, and that includes even uh, some of the ranging of our tactical radios. So. So th this, this would be, uh, originally that list was about $10.1 million, I think, on the survey. I think that's what we, we looked at, was about 10.1. Um, we could obviously tweak this, but when we went through the list and added a few items, it grew to $11.6 million, but that would include these items. Originally, remember, most of that $10.1 million was the $9 million for electrical at North and West. So some of these extras in terms of the Kimball rigging, the generators, the fire alarm systems, um, and probably the largest one there in one shot is uh, the Carl Traeger boilers and boiler room piping. Those items w would be what we would recommend potentially adding to that, uh, and that would be that half of the overall package should the board choose to go for uh, a capital project. That's the deferred, that's the deferred maintenance package. Um, that would be stuck together with the safety and security package. So just for clarification, Dr. Gunlock, we're going from up what we surveyed originally at $10.1 million to approximately $11.7 million. Right, for this piece. Now, the security side was off also about $10 million. What, what? 11, 11 for safety and security and 10.1 for maintenance. Right, so the 11 for safety and security, we probably, if you added in the, the PA systems and the security cameras in there, that would go up by that amount. And we're getting those costs at this time of what that would actually look like for us. And we should have those costs the next time we meet, or at yes. least a rough estimate, because Sorry. a lot of these we do an estimate by the contractor. That obviously, when we go to formal bid, that, that really tightens down what the cost would be. So the infrastructure also noted um, replacing roofing sections at uh, North, Perry Tipler, Webster Elementary, and Middle. So would that, would the roofing costs be in addition to the 11.7? They would. Uh, do we as have we an were estimate finding, on those? I'm sorry, do we have an estimate on, on those roof repairs? Oh, I do. Uh, not with me today. Okay. We, as we were refining this list, we decided to pull hardscape items off, roofing items off, and try to focus strictly on, on life safety to make it a manageable package okay. the original list was like 14 million and we thought Correct. between that and the added security that we were going too much higher than the original question in the survey and that we wanted to stick to fairly close to the integrity of the original question. right we right. didn't want to get too right. far off Definitely. that yeah. okay. to answer your question however the roofing <laughs> was about three hundred thousand dollars for Tipler. just for that Tipler? was on the original list correct okay. thank you can I'm sorry. Can you scroll through that list one more one more time? Sure. Let's um, scroll up down. Or down. I think. Yep. Down. Mm -hmm. We don't have it on here. No, no you don't. don't. Yeah. Are we, we able to get mm -hmm. an updated? Thank you. I mean, this is a work in progress. I yes, think for right. you guys. So, yep. um, my question, and, and you kind of hit on it, is that um, is that we only have it looks like we have a limited amount of schools that have generators. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. And is it is it just these four schools? Five. North Five. Five. Correct. Correct. So North's must be newer, that it doesn't need? Well, we have some generators tied to uh, certain pieces, like Merrill, for example, has a generator, but that does not power the whole building, nor oh. the safety lights. That just okay. powers our, our data system. Because remember, that's our north side data hub. So that sort of powers right. our internet connection as it goes out. Sure. So if we lost power at Merrill, we would still have power that sends our data systems to all the schools. Okay. Remember, think of everything, <coughs> everything stars out from central office and Merrill Middle it's School. Yeah. So if we lost <coughs> either one of them, that's why we have a big generator sitting out there. They have a very similar generator sitting outside of Merrill. And that keeps that data system flowing so things like security cameras, phones, etc., cetera, uh, continue to run in the event, even if we had a, a minor power disruption at Merrill or at central office. Okay. So the five generators in question do not power technology they power just strictly school infrastructure. Okay. Right. Uh, I would say North 
high school's generator is the newest. It's still vintage to when the building was built. Uh, the other ones are just that much older. Okay. And then my next question uh, related to the, the fire the fire alarm updates, you, you stated it differently than uh, what, was the, what was the terminology that you used? Um, I don't know. You, you didn't. But my, my question is um, it, it related to the updates. So yeah. are these schools, obviously, fire alarm updates, they've, they've been updated since they've been built. Uh, and they've been continuously updated. What makes these different than um, the other, you know, than, than, the, than the other existing <laughs> systems within the schools? Uh, many of the schools have some of the original fire alarm systems still in them. They're very, very antiquated. Some of the schools only have pull stations. They don't have smoke heads at all. Okay. Uh, they don't have devices, strobes, horns, anything. Uh, so it's it's that critical of a need as we work through our schools, and that's why I said we. Through a third party, we, we really tried to identify what was the, the neediest school to what is our more current schools. And then some of our more current schools may be operating off a simplex system that might be you know, 30 years old sure. or 40 years old. So uh, as we update these systems, you're, they're, they're complying with today's standard, which is going to be more of a, a voice strobe, all the modern devices with a modern head end. More importantly, these are systems that will call out to a monitoring station in the event yep. that the building is unoccupied and catches fire. A lot of our existing buildings do not have that technology incorporated okay. into them. Now, right. this is uh, uh, alarms and strobes. This this is not sprinklers. No, correct? it's not sprinkler systems. So. And so these are complete systems. Uh, this is this is full piping, all new wiring, all new devices, which is going to be your horn strobe sure. front end, all new technology. And. In my experience, a lot of these newer updated systems are, are much smarter systems. They tell you uh, where there's areas that need, uh, you know, updating or cleaning or, or stuff like that, so that so that our staff, your your staff, can do a better job of monitoring uh, the system and making sure that it's running as it should. Correct. Yeah, that's exactly right. The newer systems are fully addressable, so we know if a student pulled a pull station, where it was sure. pulled. Uh, if there's, uh, if a smoke head triggers, we know exactly what smoke head triggered. That's not only important for us, but important for the fire department. So as they respond, they know exactly where they need to go looking in the building for a problem. Um, as I said, the systems call out, the systems check themselves repeatedly, so we know if there's a line failure, um, because they're calling out to the monitoring station. They do a lot of, a lot of great things. Um, you know, perhaps more importantly is that they're updatable. So mm -hmm. this is a sustainable product. Uh, both the firmware and software in these particular fire panels can be updated, so they're not going to be locked into five-year-old, ten-year-old technology. We can constantly refine these panels as they age. Okay. And then my, my final question to that, just and this is so that, that the community hears and understands this, that's the type of technology that we want to put in to these schools for their fire alarm systems, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And yeah. have been. We've yeah. had five we of them updated now. Sure. And we still have quite a few sites that do not call the fire department when automatically when the alarm is pulled if nobody's in that building. So um, that that would be that would be nice to have that as well. Sure. And it's also a conversation that many school districts across um, Wisconsin are having with their different fire marshals, as well as with mm -hmm. ours, in alignment with um, school safety, um, so that if an alarm goes off, what is the immediacy of evacuating a building? So I'm not going into a lot sure. of details for obvious reasons on that, but there are conversations occurring in which would necessitate us being able to know where the fire alarm was pulled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you please um, elaborate on the HVAC uh, reference to Carl Traeger, please? Yes. Uh, as I said, Carl Traeger, there are two buildings that are currently operating um, original generations of boilers. That's Jefferson and Carl Traeger. And while that may not seem old, it's 20 years. Um, this particular boiler room, uh, Carl Traeger is an, <laughs> an interesting conversation because <laughs> Uh, when that building was built, while it, it certainly is fairly new, relatively so, uh, there were some oddities about that building and how it was designed and how it was piped and, and the types of boilers that were put into that building. So 
when we went through our Act 32 project, which I believe was 2017 at Carl Traeger, uh, we had to redo quite a bit of the <coughs> piping. Um, we had to add different elements to the system to get the, the heating to where it would work properly. So the, the one piece of the puzzle that we did not address relative to that building was the, the boiler room. And as we start to look at our existing boilers, our thermal solutions that we've put into our buildings, uh, you know, really they're a, they're a 20 to 25 year product. You can, you can certainly get them to last longer, uh, but that's not the position that we want to put ourselves into because that's what got us to where we are today. So we're trying to be a little proactive. Um, we do have pumps that we've had problems with that need to be replaced. We've got piping configurations that aren't right, uh, but we were able to temporarily make them work and the building is heating properly. Uh, but this is a large enough number that it be very difficult to pull out of a capital improvement budget, an annual capital improvement budget, whereas the modular boilers, which are different than what is a Carl Traeger, they're the large round vessels like you might see in an old movie or something like that. Uh, Jefferson's technology is a little bit different. So those we can approach through capital improvement because we can replace one or two boilers and still maintain operational capacity and replace two more the following year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I also have a question on the safety and security recommendations. The FAC completed its work about mid-November and I believe we had a report uh, from them around the 18th. Does that sound right about mm -hmm, the 18th mm -hmm. of November? Since then, there have been a number <coughs> of things that have happened in the district that have that has caused the district, th things that have caused the district to review its safety and security uh, district-wide. What are some of those, uh, without going into too much detail, right. uh, what are some of those safety and security needs that have recently emerged? Well, I think one of the main safety and security needs that, that stood out the most was notification. The, okay. the ability that when something occurs, how do we go ahead and we notify the building that something's happening. Um, the ALICE protocols were followed very, very well, but that, that stops if we're unable to notify certain sections of the building. So we can be, be awesome at the office level, but if, it doesn't, if that message doesn't get all the way to the far end, and uh, anybody who's been at West knows the far end's a hike from, the, from where the office is, um, that becomes a problem. So um, that, that's a big piece with this, is making sure that not only that communication is there, but we also are able to deliver it more than just in a, in a speaker in a hallway that we're able to get that message into classrooms consistently and also potentially override the technology that's being used in the classroom to display it to everybody. So that's, that's, that's one of the big ones that, that stood out in our after action meetings was how do we make sure notification occurs? Um, and that includes where and how often, you know, uh, the fact somebody should be able to key in the notification, whatever that notification may be, from wherever they are. And, and right now that capability is, is very limited. So is Thank that you. what, I'm so sorry, Mark. Uh, okay. Is that, so that's why you're, why, is that what brought up the PA system going to digital, trying to get into those? Yep. Okay. Yeah, ultimately okay. that, plugging all of that in, and we have parts of that okay. infrastructure in place. Uh, you're, you're pretty yeah. limited in an analog system yeah. okay. to be able to do some of that. I kind of figure, yeah. yeah. Okay. Other comments or questions on these first two recommendations? When so you, when you, excuse me, when you stop and think about the, um, the last um, meeting we had when we talked about the recommendations from the FAC, Facilities Advisory Committee, um, there were a number of things that, that really stood out and certainly se safety and security is our number one concern for everyone in the building at any given time. And given the um, infrastructure, we have to take care of the infrastructure. It's like when someone, someone buys a house and it's an older home, chances are you may have to do something with the electrical or the plumbing and that's just, that just seems to be inevitable. And uh, this is much larger, <laughs> obviously, than a, than a home construction, but um, we have to take care of our resources. We have to be good stewards of all the resources that we have in the district, whether those are monetary or their physical facilities, our human resources. And uh, to me, these first two uh, address some of those issues. So thank you. 
So, so why don't we cycle through the the rest, and then and then we kind of I kind of mm -hmm. tossed in a summary slide at the end that does the whole picture in one shot. Um, the other part of the recommendations was continuing to engage the community on the other two parts of phase one, and that is uh, rebuilding Merrill and then rebuilding uh, Webster Elementary School. If you remember from the survey results, we did not have enough re we did not have enough support to tip it in the net. But that's largely because we had a significant number that were undecided and needed more information to make that decision. I can tell you in the communications I've had with our staff, which is extensive, um, I think that has pivoted. The more, inf the more information people have on this topic, the more it makes sense. So I, I'm very hopeful that we're going to be able to make some progress down this road, um, largely through a solid information campaign so that um, our citizens in Oshkosh know what we know. Because ultimately, I, I have every confidence that they'll they'll make good decisions after mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, the other piece was using key criteria for school site adequacy assessments. This was the uh, Tipler South Park dilemma. If you were indeed going to uh, use one facility, which one would it be? How would you make that choice? You could do the same thing in terms of some elementary schools. If you're going to keep a site or enhance a site, which site would you use? Well, these are just some core criteria that we would go ahead and use. Um, we talked about these today at our, at our meeting, and I, I know, Jim, you brought up one, too, in terms of, of layering in the idea of enrollment into here as well. In other words, obviously, you want a site in proximity to where the kids are living as well. Um, so all of these would be, would in a sense, be utilized if we were in a situation where we had to make a choice between two particular facilities, and we could go left or we could go right, how would we make that choice? So that was, that was the other component. Um, committing to long-term consolidation efforts, this gets into that idea of going from 20 <coughs> sites to 14. Um, that was another recommendation is that continuing down that path for the obvious reasons around operational efficiency and make sure that the taxpayer resources that we do have are being diverted into the most modernized, most cost-effective and efficient facilities that we can. That are very specific to student needs and student focused. So yes. it's, it's more than just operational costs. Correct. Um, and it also, you know, one of the things that we, we often talk about at the end of that conversation is how do we create facilities that are future ready, that allow us to go ahead and offer an, offer an education that prepares students for their future. Um, the, the, you know, as, as Dr. Herzog said eloquently last time, there were a lot of services that were not even in, in existence when most of our sites were built. So. Uh, adopting the long-term consolidation pathway B. Now, this is not something the board would have to do in the in the absolute immediate term. But I but one of the things that that um, we keep hearing is people would love to know the entire plan and realizing that the tail end of the plan is a draft. It may not exactly look like that when it's done. But really, what is the plan? I, I know uh, Stephanie, you brought up the idea of having a other organizations have long-term facility plans. You know when facilities are going to retire. I think that's really important here too, and that's that was what the FAC kind of recommended: is is go ahead and adopt the pathway. Let people know which schools are are frankly slated for not existing much longer if we are able to get modernized, better spaces to have their kids educated in. Um, I think people understand that. Um, the, the, that gets us to the idea of going from 20 schools to 14, and in the subsequent slides we can see kind of how that takes a look. And these are, these are just repeat slides, so for people watching from home, there's nothing new here. We've been saying this probably for about three months now. Um, the pathway option B, and you can see it here laid out, probably the better way to look at it is on the next slide, or sorry, two slides. This is our current existing district. You can see our 20 different schools as they are laid out and how they feed into our three middles on the west side, our two middles on the north side, and then of course north high and west high. Pathway option B would essentially look like this, where we would go down to um, potentially five elementary schools on the west side, four elementary schools on the north side, feeding into two middles on the west, one middle on the north, and then those are into the high school. I think it's also important to understand that, that we are not looking at the river as a hard boundary. We're not looking at Highway 41 as a hard boundary. 
that boundary adjustments are normal, they are healthy. School districts do this all the time. Um, so that's just something to be, be mindful of. Uh, we did our last boundary adjustment when we built Oaklawn. So there are several options here in Pathway B, but this was, this was one of the options where we would build a new Merrill school. Uh, you'd have a new Webster, and in this particular instance, you would see that uh, on the north side, uh, the Washington Elementary would no longer be in operation. Um, you can see on the west side, we have um, a new uh, South Park Middle, a new Traeger Middle. Granted, that would be in like a phase two, but, but you know, showing what is the end game, this, is, this would essentially be the end game in Pathway B. There are several ways we can do this, and this is why I say it's a little, you know, people say, well, tell me exactly what's going to transpire. There are multiple choices that the board, a future board, would have to make in terms of which sites would you, in a sense, close and how would that look. The reason we don't make all of those choices in granite here in 2019 is because in 2020 or 2021 or 2022, when some of these things would actually start to happen, our enrollment patterns are going to be a little different, our community needs are going to be a little different. Um, we have to be flexible in terms of uh, making a good decision at that moment in time. So this was a potential option for phase one elementary. This just shows you one example of closing Maryland, Washington. There's another way to do this where you would close Maryland Webster. Um, we probably would more so stick with, I, our recommendation was originally option one, but this just is an example saying there is more than one way to do some of these once you get to that point. Okay? But overall, the idea of going from 20 to 14 remains. The additional recommendations, uh, providing taxpayer impact charts, um, I can tell you we're probably going to do that anyways. Uh, that is just something, as you know, as you've followed us as we've passed referenda in the past, uh, we always use the same charts, we use the same colors, we use the same sources so that everybody can replicate the data themselves. Uh, the including playground equipment within project scope, uh, that, that was, uh, uh, that's actually one of my favorite ones, to be honest. I kind of like that one. As a former elementary school principal, it was always really tough when you were a small, uh, high free reduced community getting PTO funds to do the same playgrounds that everybody has elsewhere. So I, I personally kind of like that one. Dr. Conley, I have a question on the provide taxpayer impact charts. Mm -hmm. Is that how much the referendum would cost them? Yes. Yeah, in, in, in different ways. Right. You know, they, they want to see in terms of short-term, long-term, et cetera, uh, being able to provide that information so that the voters are very well informed of this is exactly what is going to cost me. You know, the transparency yeah. that we and have used in Oshkosh yeah. has, been, has been really awesome. Um, I wish we had that transparency in all areas, but it, 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 for us, that's something that we've really found to be successful and, and people we've talked to in the community seem to appreciate. I would love that if our, our citizens could see even the taxes that they pay in, how that breaks down to your schools and how that mm -hmm. goes into your schools for all of that, including vouchers and everything else. I would love for them to be able to see exactly where all that goes to. Right. right. I know we can't do that right yet, but I would love that on there. So, so this slide sort of grabs the whole thing and throws it in summary. We can obviously go back to any of the slides, but basically here's the points. The line is just between the, the core recommendations of the FAC and the additional recommendations of the FAC. So pursuing the April 2020 capital referendum for those two components, and then there's engaging the community for phase one middle school and elementary projects. You know, not losing sight of the Merrill Webster solution, mm -hmm. explaining why that is. And I honestly think that bullet point is really tied to uh, the commit to long-term consolidation efforts. Mm -hmm. The idea of, hey, this is part, of, this is phase one of potentially four phases, maybe more, but this is how this puzzle fits together, and this is why we're coming back. This is why we're not putting money into Merrill and Webster uh, immediately because it's our hope to come back and look at look at a better plan for those sites. Yeah. So my my worry with this is, you know, the the saying of referendum fatigue. So if we go to referendum in 2020 in April for our two top, which is what the community mm -hmm. uh, during the in the survey really su really supported, yeah. and then we don't do the rest of it, and we come back to that after they have more knowledge. 
then we're doing, I'm worried about doing back-to-back -back ref referendums. You know, so we're suggesting doing two separate ones and giving the community more, more input versus doing one. Well, I th but the amount of money is will be the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you split them up or do one, I hope people understand that. But I do worry about splitting them up. But we but, but then you if you don't split them up, you won't get the other one. Right. Yeah, I'm talking to myself right now. So <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I I, yeah. I think people are also <laughs> going to see there's a lot of districts doing exactly the same thing. Okay. In in typically in districts, they get they are always going to referendum every so many years because right. they're, they have their sites stacked, they age out. And that's why you'll see sometimes districts will go in and go, hey, we're going to a referendum for a new building, and your taxes hardly move. And people say oh, to Oshkosh, well, how though? come ours moved then? Oh. Ours moved because we haven't done that. Right. So okay. what they did is they retired debt, for example, when, um, when, oh, when is Oak Lawn done? <coughs> 20, 20 years. Yeah, 20 more years. So let's not use that one. <laughs> but, but, but example, if we, had, if we had an Oak Lawn coming off and we were building a new Webster, the tax impact they would be relatively minimal because we'd be on this rotating upgrading of facilities. Oshkosh has not done that, so we're in, in a mode of where we're, we're low debt, but these things would potentially be added costs. That's a great way to explain that. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. And I think it's also important that we're also looking at ways right now in which to try to assist the district and our community from not going to um, referendum fatigue. So, for example, we yeah. know that we have two additional operational referendums that are sunsetting here fairly soon would be minimal impact um, to what the, what the taxpayers are paying right now, okay. if any impact. But we're looking to potentially consolidate those two operational Referendums, and there is a difference between what we're talking about today, which is capital, capital yep. right. versus operational, which is how do you operate, how do you fund the services and such that you're doing. Uh, but we're looking to combine those together and um, the two the two operationals, okay. so that we're not bouncing off of those yeah. after every so many years. Um, and there's even a possibility, and we don't know where the community is on this, but. Uh, there are communities across the, uh, the state of Wisconsin who are doing this. You can go and put it on the ballot for what's known as a re recurring um, operational mm -hmm. referendum, meaning that if it passes, you don't have to go back to the ballot anymore on that. Um, and it just stays the same. And it's no increase to what you're already currently paying. So you don't see an actual increase in your tax bill, or if you do, it's very minor. Right. Um, but then the oper that referendum fatigue starts to not be so heavy. Right. Uh, and other right. districts have done that. Menasha did that in 2001 for their technology enhancement. Appleton did it back in 14. Uh, I think it was 14 or 16. They did it uh, at the same time we were going to Learning Without Limits. They did theirs for five five million dollars forever um, oh, so those okay. two districts you know Menasha did six hundred thousand forever back in 2001 um, so there there are options around that okay. uh, typically you have to make sure you have the community support to do that right. we did seven years back when we did the one in 14 and 16 because at that time we were still working on rebuilding trusts with the community and I, right. I don't know that they I think they appreciated the fact that it that it was only for seven years at that time right. Yeah, not okay. The advantage of it, you know, we could collapse those two, and that's that's not necessarily for this workshop, but we could collapse those two into a single, as Dr. Cartwright said, um, and then you have the option if it's recurring or a seven-year window, it would still be one instead of having one every, you know, we have that two-year gap between both of them. Okay. This might be really um, bigger bubble, but I, I do believe that there is a misconception or a part of our community that don't understand why we go to capital referendum and why we have to go to um, operational referendum. They don't, I don't think a lot of, unless you're really involved like we are, you don't understand how the budget works from the state. So they don't understand that going to capital referendum is the only way you build schools. Like you don't, Correct. the state doesn't give you money to build schools. You have to go to capital referendum to build any school. Every single district has to do it. That is a normal pathway. Mm -hmm. And even operational districts, you know, or operational referendums. I think there's a misconception out there that we're just asking for money, mm -hmm. where Oshkosh is a very, uh, from, my under, from my experience, Oshkosh does, you know, has a tight purse and, and, they're, and that's okay too. But they don't understand, I didn't understand years ago, 
why we have to do those and, and how that budget truly works. So just maybe getting out that word of what these are and that this is this is a normal thing that districts have to do, that we're not going out of here because we were irresponsible, because we didn't take care of things. This is just a normal behavioral thing that most districts, almost all districts, have to do normally. For a capital referendum, yes. Um, yeah. With an operational referendum, and what people have to understand is that Oshkosh is considered to be a low spending district. Right. What does that mean? What yes. that means is that whereas the average FTE across the state is $10,000, $10, dollars thereabouts. The average what? The average um, um, per pupil, uh, per pupil yes. expenditure. Right. Okay. Uh, what has happened when the referendum limits went, not referendum limits. Revenue the, limits. Thank you. Revenue limits well, went into effect back in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Those districts that were above the state average, whatever that was back in the 1990s, were have been allowed to stay above that average this whole time. Mm -hmm. All the districts that were at <coughs> the average have been allowed to stay at the average this whole time. Oshkosh was well below the average way back in the 1990s. So given that we've been well below that average, compounded now over year, over year, over year, over year, over year, even though legislatively we've been, they'll raise the limit, maybe they'll go up. So for example, last year we were at $9,400 per student. This year we were able, we were allowed to go to $9,700 per student. Um, what has happened is people have to understand that has a compounding effect uh, because it's that much money each year, year over year, that you have not been able to ascertain. And so it requires, it puts the district into a position to where you have to go for operational referendums because by statute that is the only way that you can go above your revenue limit in order to supplement the services that you need in order to operate and provide resources to your students on a daily basis. So that is the, that's, it's, it's a misconception, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's even like, People are saying, you know, the governor is saying, you know, we increase our pupil per pupil expenditure across the entire state by $175 for our students. Well, what ended up happening for all low spending districts, what happened is it was not an and situation. It was not a situation, well, it can be, but it's all in the interpretation of the words, right? So what they did is rather than putting us up to the revenue limit of $9,700, and adding of an additional $175 on top of that, they put it first. So they gave us the $175 first and then put us up to the revenue limit of 9,700. Whereas if there was a district that was at 10,100, that was at the, over the state average already, they are now at $10,275. So they were actually able to realize the $175 per student. Um, but low spending districts, theoretically really were not right. because it was added prior to the, the, the limits being expanded upward. So again, we're extremely grateful, but these very small nuances have a significant impact on us because $175 times 10,000 students is over, you know, what, $1.175 million approximately? That's enormous for a district our size. So, but you're absolutely right, Ms. Olmstead, those are some of the, the misunderstandings Absolutely. that people have. Um, you know, we're not, uh, we're waiting, we're still hopeful that, you know, our vouchers um, and the amount of money that we're spending on our vouchers get to go on a tax bill so that people understand that, oh, why is the school district taxes increased so much? Well, we've, we've how much of an increase did we from last year to this year with our vouchers? Oh, well, it was significant. We had like 800,000 last year. We went to almost 1.6 million, so it was almost double. If I recall correctly, I don't know. In one year, we doubled and one our year. vouchers. Mm -hmm. And so right And on there, our tax bill, yeah. you don't see that. No. So you just think that the district is getting this money. Additional money, and we're not. And we're not. Those are the misconceptions that I have such a hard time with, and then trying to keep them straight and explain to our citizens. Well, the other thing that I think it's important to do is, is remember when we presented both the operational referendum in the past, had the state provided an inflationary increase over those years, we would not have had to go to referendum for anything. Right. The reason those $4 million holes in our budget occurred is because we had our, our spending frozen and costs, heat, lights, et cetera, continue to go up and that's where, that's where that cost, that's where that gap was. Um, so, so as people say, 
we have operational and we have capital. Capital, obviously, I think most people tend to understand uh, that that's for brick and mortar type things and, and districts have to do that just like you would when you're building a home. Um, but the operational piece, that, that was an artifact of the fact we were A, low spending, and B, we were not getting inflationary increases while we were low spending. So those two were worked against us. I appreciate both of you explaining that. And, and, and uh, really important. And I want to make sure, Ms. Schnorr, I did not misrepresent any of the facts that the no, statements you, I didn't. You thank, you. That very okay. well. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> right? Yeah. I want to make sure the worst. I was correct. Yeah. <laughs> that's the worst. <laughs> thank you both for um, answering that. I, that's one of my main concerns is the public understanding why, why we have to do that or why we're going that direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question just to clarify. Looking at that top bullet point, the pursuing April 2020 capital referendum, would they appear as two separate pieces? Maybe we haven't gotten to that discussion yet, but or would they be? I would recommend that you make them two separate questions yeah. because mm -hmm. no. then people have something to vote no for. Uh, yeah. I, I, I would make them one question. Yes, yes, that's what I was envisioning, but I don't want to make assumptions. So thank you for clarifying. Well, that would be my recommendation anyway. You as a board um, decide by January 25th have to pass a resolution as to what that question will look like. Oh, okay. You know, and I think there's a logic to that because some of the projects on <clears throat> both of those bullet points overlap. Mm -hmm. I mean, th right. there, there's some nice yeah. overlap there to those projects. They to go really, well together. Yeah, yeah they're not separate. safety. I mean, even though it's under the infrastructure, it is safety. Right. Yeah, if we're doing electrical systems, it would be a great time to add the safety and the PA and everything else. Yeah, right. That goes well together. Exactly. Okay. Got it. Depending upon what the board would decide, though, you wouldn't make the language so specific that you were tied to certain tied things. to it. But yet, you could draft the the resolution to to include both of those together for a total of of X. You know, right now we have like twenty one point one million on the table, but you know the board could decide what to do with that for safety, security, and maintenance. And um, that still would leave you some flexibility to shift the money in between the two. Mm -hmm. But they would still go for what is in right. in that part because they they might play off of each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. Moving an office, for example, may have an impact on the other side. Right. Well, obviously, this is a long-term commitment. Um, and it, and it, I believe it has to be with facilities, because there are always needs that will emerge. Just as a homeowner has emergent needs, like when a hot water heater goes out or your washer decides to quit. Um, there are always things that will emerge that we don't know in the here and now, that is how long things are going to last, whether it's a roof or a, a water PA main. system or a water main <laughs> or, or whatever that might be. So I think it's really important and I really appreciate the efforts of administration as well as this board to try to look more long term in terms of our facilities rather than year to year because yeah. we need a bigger picture and we need to plan for uh, improvements and changes and replacements and updating that are going to be needed because that's just inevitable with uh, physical facilities. We do need to give Dr. Cartwright some direction as to what we want her to, to do to investigate the, the technical uh, pieces and language to help the board decide whether or not to move forward with an April referendum. As it was just noted, uh, a Resolution would have to be passed by April 25th, which I believe is a January, Saturday. January, January, I'm sorry, we're going to get April. January 25th. That's my you. birthday, by the way. Oh. That's what you're thinking of. <laughs> that must have been it. I'm sure that was in the back of my mind subconsciously. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Um, I believe that's a Saturday, and we have a regularly scheduled board meeting for January 8th, and then I believe our second meeting of the month would be after <coughs> the 29th. January 25th. So we'd either have to have a separate meeting, special meeting, or we would have to decide by the January 8th yes, regular we meeting. Mm -hmm. So what, what additional direction does the board wish to give to Dr. Cartwright at this time? Everybody start. What are your thoughts? 29th, 8th, okay. I'm still got the calendar. I, yeah. Yep. So okay. um, I would prefer that um, that we give more, the community more time to digest the steps of moving forward to a potential referendum. So if we uh, choose that we want to go in that direction, uh, that, we, that we hold a special meeting for that in between 
uh, the first and our first and our first and second meeting of the month. Regular meetings. Regular we're meetings. About. So, um, I think uh, that's a notion to the community that that we don't want to rush it. I mean, if we put something on January eighth, we're going to get some. We're going to people are going to be upset about that because they're going to be they're going to feel that we pushed through putting a referendum on the ballot through the holiday season. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, fatigue of that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important that, that we provide um, as much time as we can. Mm -hmm. For them to ask so questions to and ask get questions information and, and that stuff. talk to us. Uh, if so if, to if talk I to may, in, in support of that, sure. it probably would be helpful for us to have a little more time, too, in, in terms of tightening up our numbers on some of these things. Okay. You know, January 8th, given the holidays okay. are in there, is, is kind of hard when we're looking at getting some uh, just some of our cost numbers tied down. Correct. So as we create a list for you to react to, the numbers are as close as possible to what they would actually be. That was going to be one of the things that I actually wrote down was that that spreadsheet that you that you have that we f that we find a way to elaborate that more concisely through those bullet points of safety and security updates right. and immediate building infrastructure maintenance because there's stuff that that you presented to us tonight that aren't that doesn't really fall under that broadness mm -hmm. of of what's up there and I think that if we're going to continue to use this uh, presentation as a as a communication point that we want to be as clear as possible in regards to fully defining what those elements are for example there's nothing up there that talks about um, fire alarms mm. I mean you I can broadly understand that safety and security and electrical systems are involved in fire alarms, but that's just because I, I know a little bit of that background. The community may not make that connection as, as easily. Right. So, so, so what we typically would do is, is you keep your, your questions somewhat broad, but then in the ancillary uh, materials that we use in our 50-plus uh, presentations that we'll be doing to the community, it'll highlight each one of those in, in a very, very effective way to say, here's what you're voting on. In general, it's that. But in specific, it's this all of this. Right. And, and right now, we're putting the cart in front of the horse in regards to how you're looking at this. Mm -hmm. I know exactly how you're trained to prepare for this, Dr. Mm -hmm. Gunlock. Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about that small window of time that we have to prepare for whether we're going to go to a referendum um, gotcha. and allowing the community Makes to sense. digest that information. Okay, I, I know you're rearing and ready to go. You've been trained <laughs> to do that. I get that. But in order for us, to feel comfortable with going to Same referendum, to it, yeah. we need to make sure that the community understands right. that that detailed information. Because a lot of times that's, I think in the past years where I've observed referendums, is that um, the community has the opportunity to digest all that from, from the point that it gets put on the ballot and mm -hmm. you guys start doing all of your work, right. but they don't ever get, they don't necessarily have the opportunity to talk to the people who they've elected to to, to kind of shape that. So, and, and I think that's an important component of success related of, of this referendum, whether it's to pass or not, is that from the point that we're in, of the inception of that decision, that we're providing as much information broadly as possible. So that's, that was one of my, that's one of my thoughts was to, if we're going to continue to use this presentation to educate not only us but the community that we uh, elaborate some more on those uh, those those areas that are part of immediate building infrastructure and maintenance and safety and security updates like adding that in, in the presentation. yeah adding what you put in that yeah. spreadsheet that was awesome. mm -hmm. yeah. is is more thorough than than what that right. says yeah. yes. and if we were to take what's in that spreadsheet and put that in there I think that tells the community something different. Yeah. Yep. You said this has to be that. done by the 25th? You have to pass a resolution by January 25th for okay. the April. Just looking at the, the month here, that third week of January is the Wasby State Convention for mm -hmm. most of the week. I mean, because the first is the first Wednesday, that means the sp that's why the first school board meeting is so early. Right. Um, and then the second school board meeting is so late Too because late. of the state convention. I mean, you could look at maybe moving the 8th to the 15th. May I make the recommendation mm -hmm. that we keep the 8th 
and we have a special board meeting on the 15th that we're keeping our, our Wednesday night. Um, that way, I, I believe we would probably, um, Ms. Woods, you might be able to help me with this, we probably would have a higher likelihood of being able to get TV if it's on the Wednesday night versus a different day of the week. Am I accurate in that? That, that could very well be. The city council meetings are Tuesday. Tuesdays. So. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Burns. Correct. I would like to see us keep the 8th uh, because that I know that's early in the month, but that would give us an opportunity to, I, I think, build off of what Mr. Peschel mm -hmm. has said, and that is to um, address this facilities report again at the meeting on the 8th with some fine tuning uh, that we need to communicate with Dr. Cartwright. And so then another workshop on the eighth. About <coughs> that, another workshop on the eighth, and okay. then uh, vote on the. That's the direction we go. Vote on the fifteenth, um, and then that still allows administration opportunity, if, and through the uh, through a committee that would be formed uh, outside of the board to promote a referendum to convey some of the specifics that um, Mr. Peschel has indicated he would like shared, which I think are important as well. With the board's mission, could we maybe switch that to Thursday night instead of the Wednesday the 15th? I think it's I'm, I'm, I'm going to be writing a strategic plan for the uh, bid, downtown bid board. So uh, we're doing that Wednesday night. How, what, what's the timing of that? Five to eight. Five to eight. Hmm. With, with our friend Walter at the three hour oh, meeting. Walter. You could do it later on Wednesday if you wanted to. You could. Later. <laughs> <laughs> Eight thirty meeting. I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, I like the idea of keeping it Wednesday because I think that makes it appear more consistent. But I also understand the conflict of having prior commitments. Well, I, again, I, I think uh, Mr. Peschel was very eloquent in stating that we need to communicate with the publics, and the administration has as well. So if we could arrange for um, Oshkosh Community Media to cover us on a Thursday night, that might be an advantage. If we needed to move it to a different night, or whatever night, obviously not a Tuesday night, because that's when the council meets, the common council. I, I, would, I would say that um, whatever n night or evening that we move it to, people will they may not be here in this room, but they will definitely be watching us out on TV because this is, you know, uh, getting, I've already been getting, you know, lots of conversation and calls about it. So I, I think that um, what we can do to make it as available to the, to the community as, as, as possible is, is important. And I think it's important for us up here to say that we want all of our board members to be involved in this discussion as well. Um, that's a message that we should send to our community is that um, that this is this is this is one of those most important topics that involves all voices that are elected to represent uh, the Oshkosh Area School District to be there. So and and you know, so so I, w I would have no problem doing that, having it on a Thursday. So so. Or clarification, just yep. double checking one hearing you is to prioritize, prior, make prioritization in two areas. One, uh, to see if we can get it to what nights are available for it to be televised. Sure. And then number two, what nights are all board members available? Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, I can consult with your, with Dr. Herzog and Ms. Olmstead and, and, find, and set a date. Am I hearing that direction um, about, right? I don't. I agree with all of it, but the priority of it having it televised, that is a, that's a must. That's right. not a, mm -hmm. we can't, we can't, we can't no. So yeah. if we can't televise it, then that's a no. That's a, a flat no on that night. It has to be able to be televised. People have to see it. They have to be able to, you know, and giving it that extra week, it gives people more time to talk to us, mm -hmm. gives, you know, um, and this, you know, executive team to do more too. So. And I also, I believe they also have the ability, if they can't live stream it at that time, that they can record it and okay. then put it um, as a televised option. So I want to make sure you're aware that mm -hmm. that is also a, pos sure. a potential possibility. So that would be immediately after the meeting, after they live stream it, they would put it on? Typically, it, it, they, they sometimes have to, had to do that in the past when programming overlaps. 
okay. where they have something else scheduled at that time, and yeah, after they're done and they, pr I think it's within 24 hours, it's mm. it's posted on their website. Yeah, I don't I don't like that. People are going to want to know immediately just, that I, night. I think it's usually just two or three hours. Oh, no. okay. But obviously I, we don't always ask that. Would it okay. be possible for us to have that meeting at one of our schools? I. It's a possibility, but it does complicate the ability of us being able to televise it. Um, for them to be able to work remotely, um, that it does get complicated. I think people would expect us to be here, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was just thinking it was an opportunity if people are going to come to the meeting to see some of the things that we're talking about in these oh. older schools. Mm -hmm. and I got what you're saying. Because mm -hmm. I remember when I went to Smith, you know. Right, I got you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think one way to address that might be to ask administration to get some photographs of some of these um, projects, these mm -hmm. physical sure. yeah. components that we would be suggesting be replaced or updated or renovated. I know that was done with, mm -hmm. with other situations, whether it was asking for more money for roofs or uh, some other uh, capital improvement project to actually see what what these mm -hmm. items look like. Just a bunch of boxes, and they have. We can't be there things. physically. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any other direction that the board wishes to give to Dr. Cartwright and her team at this point? Uh, can I can I ask a, a question? Is there sure, and maybe just to engage conversation is there anyone on the board that really feels that moving towards a referendum is a direction that we don't want to go towards and I, and I think that's and I, and I put that out there so that if if someone's on the fence I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to, to be able to discuss that um, because I think that's important to the direction that we provide um, the administration and, and going. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I, and, and personally, I value uh, dissenting information sometimes. So, yeah. so putting that out there. So that that was May I clarify that, that, sure. that question a little bit? Because I want to make sure I, I guide the board in preventing us from a, a potential polling situation. Okay. Um, so if we rephrase the question, are there any concerns that board members have that we have not addressed thus far that you need additional information on. Is that fair question? To help yes. maybe cement where people are in their thoughts. Yes. And but I, I wanna I wanna add to that that that's just we're we're right now we're just discussing of course the potential referendum. We're not Correct. touch we're not we're not discussing direction mm -hmm. related to the other bullet points at this point. We're Correct. just Correct. Right. Correct. So, just okay. just slide two. Sure. The only what we've said is my only is that I would I would like um, to help make this decision. I would like more numbers, you know, more concrete numbers, which mm -hmm. obviously we can't get right now. That's right. why we know time. Right. So that would just what we really need. Um, also be good to specifically with the new with the with the recent events, specifically with with the additions. Yeah. You know. It'd be nice to know what threshold you have. I mean, the two of them right now for, that we went to survey about was 20, 21.1 million um, at a tax impact of $19 per $100,000 of home value. I mean, is there- $19 look, per- 100,000 of year. home value. So right. if you have $100,000 house- Per month, per year? Per year. Per year, thank you. Year. Sorry. Thank um, okay. You know, I, we, we were talking about going a little higher than that. Is there a, a threshold number you would comfortable in going higher. Oh. I think those numbers are really important. Obviously, yeah. we have to give you direction on that, but I think most people want to know, first of all, that they're contributing to safety, in this case, um, and upgrading our buildings, but they also want to know what's the impact on my tax bill when I get it. Right. And if it's uh, $19 a year for on a hundred thousand dollar home, which would make it thirty-eight dollars, I believe, a year on a two hundred thousand dollar home. To put it in more concrete terms like that, I think is very important. But we do need to uh, kind of zero in on a number here. So, do you want to zero? If you can give us a range, or, um, okay. and okay. or um, 
understand that when we meet, hopefully by January 8th, we may have more solid figures? Yeah, we probably will. Um, some of them will get more solid by mm -hmm. the 14th or 15th, but yeah. I guess I'm not ready to get, me personally, I'm not mm -hmm. ready to give that range because if you get a, a, a um, what's it called, when you get a number from, an to estimate. build estimate, estimate. thank you. <laughs> I lost my thought there. When we get an estimate on the PA systems, if we put a range and then that comes back out of that, if, if that number comes, the estimate comes out back outside that range we gave, Right. I still feel that's an important thing we have to do. So I don't think I'm ready to give a range yet yeah. until I know what the estimates are with the things that we want to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we can kind of pull off or add to or move around those estimates and those numbers. You know, because um, almost everything on there was, was estimates from us, but not from, you know, it wasn't, you know, from a professional. I mean, it, our team is professionals, but it wasn't from, you know, an alarm system. It right. wasn't from... Were those numbers pretty accurate, do you really think? Or, I mean, could they really be off? You know, they're, they're, they're pretty accurate, but I, okay. they're, they're likely, there's there's a lot of flexibility in those numbers. Right, Because yeah. until you get into the walls and you get into the ground exactly. and you start digging things, that's right. when you start to find so problems. So I want, I want a little leeway on that one, too. Right. And we have no estimates in there on the PA systems. Not yet. Not yet. We're working on that So right how now. can okay. we give, yeah, how can we give a range when we don't even have that? I don't want to give a range and then that takes us out of that range. So okay. we can work internally. We believe by the 8th we'll have a better estimate as to, what, and it still will be an estimate, but it will right. be a, str but a much stronger right. estimate yeah. of what the cost will be for a total package based off the information that we have pre presented for you tonight. Ms. Nora can work on trying to figure out at that point in time or as quickly as possible, but she may not have it on that night, but right. she'll have it pretty, we will work on it as quick as we can, okay. what the actual budgetary impact will be per 100,000 100, valuation. Per year. Um, okay. mm -hmm. uh, per year. Great. Um, so that way, at that point, it will provide for the board at least, hey, this is kind of your minimum number, and yeah. then you can, at that point in time, look at what the ranges are, are that you would be comfortable with for, with us pursuing in order to follow back up. If we want to go that route. Um, if you want to pursue the referendum. a referendum. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And it's just important to understand that as we've gone through this, it, it, even if you did not exist as an entity, one of the things that we've been working on is trying not to get it very far from that amount. So we've sort of been trying to put a cap on ourselves not going too far sure. as we've looked at the Good. various items sure. to say, okay, right. we really don't want to get far from the number that we surveyed on, mm -hmm. not yeah. too far, yet we want to be able to do some a couple of these ex extra things that have really come up. So. Yeah. Mrs. Brown? Oh, I was just going to ask Dr. Cartwright for the greater good, because you do a really good job explaining this, of um, how neighbor people are afraid we're going to lose their neighborhood schools. And you did a great job explaining to me about micro neighborhood schools versus a neighborhood school, and that we're kind of right-sizing, and it's still going to be relatively small. Um, Cool. So in the future, at the elementary level. So in the future, as we continue with these presentations, um, beyond uh, the first recommendation of, of an April 2020 um, capital referendum, uh, when we start getting into discussions related to phase one, uh, the second part of phase one is, you know, so what is the right <coughs> sizing of the district? What does that actually look like? And do you want to adopt the recommendations of the FAC? Um, and within a majority, within many of our elementary schools currently, we have elementary schools that are that are in proximity to one another to where they would not even qualify for bus transportation, mm -hmm. uh, with our, if we provide bus transportation throughout the district, um, because that criteria is usually within t um, two. If you if you live within two miles of a school, you would not qualify. Overall, now there are some exceptions to that rule. Uh, but we have many of our schools that are walkable just from one school to the next school. Um, and so, and again, we're really looking at just trying to right size the district. And I'll be able to answer that question much more thoroughly when we get into the, that portion of the recommendation. And one more thing for the greater good, could you please explain that it's not, we're 
class sizes are not increasing. Cause I hear from the community no. members that this plan is going to make class sizes double, and <coughs> that's not no. what's happening. No, no, um, because you know the, the, your staff follow your student for the most your students for the most part. Actually, by creating um, those larger those larger school sizes, you're actually able to provide more services to your students number one number two you're also able to right size class loads what does that mean um and dr gunlott did an exceptional job at this last time at his presentation um so what happens is when you have a school that may only have one track one section of kindergarten we'll run that section hot we'll run it up to 28 or higher students and with one teacher because we can't afford literally to break it up to two class sizes because it's just too small. But when you get to three to four sections of kindergartners, now you're able to split that class load out amongst those teachers. <coughs> and so you actually, in a lot of cases, end up with either a more consistent class size, and that more consistent class size tends to be less um, than your smaller Excellent. school sizes. Dr. Gunlight, did I explain that? Yeah, you did. Uh, we actually had a real example. We, we would have been running a hot section at Smith in grade five and a very hot section at Jefferson in grade five, and instead we ran three sections at Jefferson that are, that are very well balanced. And just for common language, hot means? More than, a, and we have a, a class size limit up to, um, outside of the AGR schools, 24 students K3, 27 students grades four on up. Uh, sometimes we have to run them above those limits. That's what we call running a section hot. Um, we would have ha had two very overloaded sections at uh, uh, Smith and Jefferson. When you merged them together, you broke them apart into three sections that were far more manageable and very decent sized, and we're actually running cool. So we also run some sections cool, where they're a little bit lower. So. Thank so, you. Because I've attended elementary music concerts over the last roughly month, what I've observed is when I look at the number of students on the stage and divide it by the number of teachers at a particular grade level, those numbers are typically under 25 per student. Yes. Uh, per, per teacher, excuse me. So um, those numbers seem to be, um, at least from a ratio standpoint, more reasonable. I, I don't see any groups that would, uh, say, have 90 students for divided among four, three teachers. I just haven't observed that. The other thing that came up at the League of Women Voters conversation was uh, we did have some situations where they <coughs> said we have large schools now that have some very high class sizes. So how do you reconcile that? And I explained that, that we, we staff as one system. So um, that means we spread the FTE across the entire district. And because we have so many small schools and we have to feed those FTEs a little bit differently, sometimes that means we need to pull those FTEs for that we would normally put at some of the large schools. So in other words, you have to balance it. And small schools means that it's harder to balance it and sometimes we have to run sections that are not at the small schools hotter just to balance out our FTEs to make sure we're, we stay within budget. And just clarification, so the smaller schools may be running a little bit cool, which causes the larger schools to run hot. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other comments or questions, Mr. Peschel? Do you have something? I, well, I kind of, kind of want. I want to keep us on track. I want to talk about what you guys are all talking about, but I want to make sure that we've completed our direction related to uh, the pursuing of of the referendum for April. So, um, so if there's if there's anyone else that wants to talk about the referendum, that going that way, I'd, I'd yield my time to that. But if if there isn't, I'll, I'll go into my my next thoughts. Well, I, I think I've asked the board a couple of times if they had any other direction they wanted to give sure. to Dr. Cartwright. Okay. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak on the question of uh, the first recommendation up there pursue an April 2020 capital referendum on safety, security updates, and immediate building structure and maintenance to keep us focused, as you've suggested? Thank you. Anyone so, else? I don't necessarily have a direction, but kind of to speak to how Bob wanted it to open up the discussion. I will say that when I personally took the survey, I was more in favor of building new schools because I feel like that should be our district's priority. But when you get the survey and you get the recommendation from the FAC and you get more information, I can see why we're doing it. 
in the order that we are. And so I think, again, just going back to the things you've already said, helping community members get that sort of information and understanding why phase one is a process and it's stepped and we're delaying the second and third part of phase one. Talking about, um, sorry, now I feel like I've lost my train of thought too. It's late, right? <laughs> But I think it's important to help people understand why we're putting that on hold for now and we're respecting the survey and the FAC recommendations and just doing phase one and two. Uh, phase, part one, part, phase yes, one. Phase, phase one. Part one and two of phase one, yes. correct. And I mean, we can talk about the part three and four of phase one right now, but we're gonna talk about them after we complete phase, phase one. part one and two of phase one. I think that just, it makes sense that there's an order to this. Sure. And I, I wanna, I guess I wanna preface what you just said is that I think what's going on from what I'm hearing is that we're all acknowledging that our group of people that have an interest in the district and have answered all those surveys and have talked to us and talked to our administration um, have clearly told us that this is something that they're comfortable with us engaging in discussion with the, with the community uh, around a referendum. And so I think, that's, I think that's really important. And to put that, you know, I, I, think, that's, I think that's important to acknowledge that, um, that, that even though we may have our own personal things of, of, mm -hmm. of the directions of which our district should go in, but that we're willing to put those behind yes. and work towards this because this is the direction that our community is kind of giving us. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you for summarizing and I think, what I was And I think that's really important to acknowledge <laughs> that and, to, and just to acknowledge that publicly. So mm -hmm. um, so I have nothing else about the, the referendum, but I have some thoughts and comments about the, the, com the commit to a long-term consolidation two efforts. Um, okay, well, right now we're just focusing on okay that first point so that we are giving direction to Dr. Cartwright tonight. So yeah, that's correct. what I was trying to say. I feel like we should discuss the consolidation efforts at a different meeting, at a separate meeting. Well, we can do that. I mean, we are noticed to discuss the recommendations and those certainly were part of that, but right now I want to make sure that we're giving yeah, Dr. Cartwright and her team the direction they need to prepare for that January 8th meeting because that's going to come up quickly. Yeah. Uh, there are two more working days essentially and when we uh, until this the holiday break and then everybody returns on January 2nd and the meeting is the 8th so I want to make sure that we have that focus clear uh, so let me turn to Dr. Cartwright and say is there anything else you need from the board at this time mm -hmm. in terms of providing you with direction team well if we're gonna have a special meeting I mean we'll, we'll, we'll if we'll have another workshop on the 8th if there's any more information you will provide, but then on the 8th, you would give us the information that we need to prepare the resolution. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. My understanding. Yes. Okay, we just have to decide what date we're gonna, I mean, I Correct. we're gonna decide that right now. No, mm -hmm. oh, that's something that, that they directed me to take a look into as and to look for oh, dates that I have very specific criteria. Yep. I know yep. what, what your desires sure. are on that. Yep. Do we, okay. do um, we, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Fox, Dr. Gunlock, um, any other questions you have? Not in relation to, to that piece. Um, I do think it's always been our, our thought that after we got the, the April uh, decisions made and got that process moving, then we have our, our marching orders to get us to that point that um, you know, it would be at the board's pleasure when they would cycle back and begin looking at the other bullets the discussion of consolidation or whatever, you know, and I think that would be totally healthy because as we go out there and, and work with the community on whatever the board decides for the April referendum, mm -hmm. I fully expect we're going to be asked, what's the overall game plan? Mm -hmm. What are we doing next? Mm -hmm. What happened to part three and four and all these other pieces? We're probably going to need to have some of that information as we present so that they feel that part one and two are part of an overall coordinated effort. Sense. But we have time for that. I, I feel as though we have direction as to what the board is All asking right. us. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, board members. And now, Mr. Preshel. Actually, did you? I was just going to ask a quick question on when we might have that date for the next meeting. Well, we'll let's start be. working on it tomorrow. Okay. I just wondered. Yeah. I know because the holiday makes it tricky. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> we could have it in two days, or it could be all the way till January second. 
the next one? No, it wouldn't be until after January no. 8th. No, she's Sorry. saying notification. I mean, notification, oh, notification. of. Oh, okay, got it. Because I got it. would like to know as soon as possible. Sure. But, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's a fair question. Got it. <laughs> All right. Mr. Peschel. Thank you. Um, you can tell I'm excited to talk about this stuff tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so That's good. one of. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, but right now we're just discussing recommendations. We have not um, taken a vote on no. the recommendations of the of the facility advisory committee. Correct? No, that is correct. So, Nor okay. have we been noticed to do yeah, so. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. So, so, um, so that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that that we weren't again putting the proverbial cart, you know, in front of the horse on this one. Mm -hmm. So. Um, my, I guess, and my, my next thought is that um, knowing that we haven't provided you any direction on regards to those next steps yet, um, I still think as it's a public plan that's kind of out there and that the public and the public's worked on, um, I think it's that, that portion of committing to that long range plan. It's the only comments that I would put out to that is I think it's really important right now to start thinking about um, that school consolidation plan in the sense of community planning. You know, what impact is something like that going to have on transportation or um, the types of developments that take place in those areas or, or any of that. If we can start projecting that with our, with our community partners, um, it'll give us a much better picture of planning of how that all, of how those impacts work out. Um, and that's one of the things that, and we all, we've all heard this, is that's one of the things that we sometimes miss out on, uh, is that intergovernmental uh, uh, collaboration in, in trying to project stuff like that out. And, and I think that if we're looking long term, it's a perfect opportunity to take uh, this plan and look at it like on the city's comprehensive plan mm -hmm. and look at it from that perspective or the transportation development plan as it relates to public transit as it relates to where these schools are or where they may not be in the future and how that impacts all of that um, and to kind of give us a much broader view of what the impact of consolidating schools at other than just a, a short-term view of it which our community tends to believe that we do more of than than the long term so speaking generally um, but I think it's I just think it's important to note that so. And we're very appreciative of the city for sending their planner to our FAC meetings yep. um, towards the end, so that they did have a voice in some of those, some of those pathways as well. And we will continue to reach out to the city um, in coordination of that as we continue with the recommendations. Sure. Are there any other questions or comments at this time on the topic? I think, um, Mr. Peschel, the the slide before this one that, that Dr. Gunlock had up there on the screen um, addresses those next components mm -hmm. that you, mm -hmm. were, you were speaking about from a from a high level mm -hmm. viewpoint and eventually more detail can be fleshed yeah. out in terms of working with other government and non-government entities as well idea. as gain, engaging the co internal and external community that is the people who work within mm -hmm. the system yeah and those who do not. Because clearly the survey communicated to the board and to the FAC that more information is needed mm -hmm. on uh, everything under points uh, two, three, and four there above the line. Any other conversation or discussion on, on this topic? And administration has indicated that they're good to go with a workshop for the next meeting, which would be January 8th. And then we'll work on getting a date for a, a meeting with uh, OCM, Oshkosh Community Media, here on uh, a, subs a special meeting, probably during the week of the 13th, the 13th January 13th. All right, thank you presenters, Mr. Fox, Dr. Gunlock, Mrs. Schnorr, and thank you, board, for your robust conversation this evening. Thank you. So moving on to the rest of our agenda, are there any requests for future agenda items at this time? Okay, seeing none, uh, 
Are there any announcements at this time? <laughs> I would just like to acknowledge that at this time of year, there are many groups throughout our community and our nation that have celebrations, re uh, regardless of their various beliefs. And uh, on behalf of the board, I would just like to announce that we wish all of you a very safe, restful, um, relaxing, and uh, happy Everybody. holiday season. And that uh, my wish for this season is that we uh, engage as a community and as a nation in a sense of healing and a sense of peace. So wish you all a, a happy holiday season. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session for the purpose of uh, one, considering the disciplinary data of specific persons under Wisconsin Statute 19.85 per end one per end F of Wisconsin statutes, review expulsion recommendation from an expulsion hearing officer for a high school student who engaged in conduct constituting repeated refusal or neglect to obey the rules under Wisconsin Statute 120.13 Paren 1, Paren C, Paren E. Two, review expulsion recommendations from a hearing officer for a high school student who engaged in conduct while at school or while under the supervision of a school authority which endangered the property, health, or safety of others, endangered the property, health, or safety of any employee or school board member of the school district in which the pupil is enrolled and engaged in conduct constituting repeated refusal or neglect to obey the rules under Wisconsin Statute 120.13, paren 1, paren C, paren E. And C, review expulsion recommendations from an expulsion hearing officer for a high school student who, while not at school or while not under the supervision of a school authority, engaged in conduct which endangered the property, health, or safety of others at school or under the supervision of a school authority and engaged in conduct constituting repeated refusal or neglect to obey the rules under Wisconsin Statute 120.13, parent 1, parent C, parent E. So moved. Second. <laughs> Please call the roll. Homestead? Aye. Peschel? Aye. Salachi? Aye. Carlin? Aye. Evans? Aye. Carter? First Aye. Motion carried. This meeting is adjourned. Happy holidays, everyone.